Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 4, 5 and 6 in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The second item on the agenda this morning is to consider the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. We've been joined by a panel of witnesses. Can I welcome Alec Kinninmouth from the RSPB, Councillor Norman MacDonald from Western Isles, Audrey McIver from Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Dr Callum McLeod from Community Land Scotland, and Andy Wells from the Crown Estate Scotland. Um, as you can imagine, we have a number of questions for you. Uh, we move uh, to question number one, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, convener. Um, there probably is no better group, diversity as it is, that I might ask my question to. Um, the bill has a focus on good management. What makes a good manager? Oh, they're all dodging that one, convener. I'll make a start, given that it's a... Uh, one of the terms of the Crown Estate Act 61, and it's obviously a subject for the committee to consider in relation to the, how that sort of transfers into the, the new bill. Um, the, the, the term of good management uh, in the Act and how it's been interpreted to date has been around the question of operating uh, the business in such a way as to uh, deliver growth in the business, deliver uh, capital growth to the assets, and um, to deliver revenue and turn that into account, but according to good management. And that covers a wide range of different, it's the, the how you do things in terms of how you operate, how you collaborate, how you, how you, um, how you work in partnership. It's also about um, how you take into account a wider range of, of, of benefits in relation to um, what you can deliver as a result of any particular transaction or a particular decision. Um, and while the new bill sort of specifies that this should be um, interpreted in more in terms of social and economic uh, and environmental objectives are more of a sustainable approach to management. That's something the Crown Estate historically ha has always sort of interpreted good management to be. It's around making decisions which are in the best interests of a range of different considerations and one which clearly is backed against a commercial decision given the terms of the Act but also takes account of, of, of wider considerations. So before moving to others, um, I, I hear from that that it's more than simply the measurable outcomes. It's also about the process by which the Crown Estate, uh, the Crown managers have to operate and the respect that they will give to those with whom they work. Is that my correctly hearing what's being said? I think that would be a fair interpretation. Right, okay. Um, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stevens. I, I think it's a really important question to, to, to start off with um, and it, it's I mean there, there, there are various characteristics I suppose or dimensions that make up a good manager one is around transparency of how you act certainly and in terms of accountability as well in relation to the, your various stakeholders uh, and in relation to, to, to actually serving the range of stakeholders that you're, you're managing assets for uh, and, and so having that kind of process in place and, and uh, meeting those sort of best value characteristics are very important, clearly. But it's really uh, actually very heartening as well, I think, in terms of thinking about what constitutes a good manager within the context of, of managing Crown Estate assets that we now, in this bill, have a clear, unambiguous uh, iteration of the fact that, we, when, and, and as Andy just, just mentioned there, we, we're not just thinking about managing assets in relation to their the financial uh, components, the, the focus on uh, in, environmental and social aspects are clearly fundamentally important in terms of that too. So good management, I think I would suggest, and Community Land Scotland would suggest, is, is very much around um, <coughs> focusing on these broader considerations and seeing, or, or ensuring rather, how the assets themselves are managed in ways which uh, tie into uh, a, a wide array of um, public policy objectives, not least, of course, community empowerment and what that might mean in practice. Can I just go to Mr. Kenneth? Well, in particular, given that uh, the, uh, 
the consultation had 79% of respondents uh, saying that environmental considerations should be uh, part of it. I, I take it that's something in which you would be particularly interested in the organisations you represent. Yeah, abso absolutely. But uh, as well as that, I would, I, would, I would echo what you've just heard in terms of, of good management being around transparency and accountability to those wider public objectives, of which environment is, is obviously very key for Scotland. I think just go, um, that if you look at the 1961 Act and how that's been interpreted, uh, as, as Andy was, was covering there, it's been very much given the, the current state commissioners have taken that as a very narrow financial remit, and albeit under the principles of good management, but it's always been under the, uh, you know, up to the commissioners to define what, what they feel good management is. I think there's been a lot of progress in recent years towards defining good management in terms of environmental well-being. Um, and certainly looking at uh, approaches on, on, on widening what value means in terms of uh, value in terms of natural capital or the, the ecosystem services that you can get from, from, from natural assets. And I think that what the, what's encouraging in the bill and, and in response to that, that consultation uh, question is actually widening out those, those duties on the manager to include other considerations and those wider benefits that were, were talked about. I think um, certainly I can see the intention in the bill to bring those in, into play a, little, a lot more, but concerned that, that, that Section 7 on the duties of managers still retains that primary duty to maintain and enhance the financial value and the income um, generated from it with the additional outcomes kind of seen as secondary uh, or discretionary indeed. And I think there's certainly room for improvement in the, in the bill <laughs> to make it clearer that, you know, on the financial gain and, and getting good return from the assets is not necessarily in conflict with achieving those wider societal aims. Can I uh, go to Councillor MacDonald? Uh, I, th I think you've got in your council area some significant areas of community ownership, storage used is one of a, of, a, of a range of them. Do these provide a model of the relationship between those who are stakeholders who live in the area uh, and the duties of managers to uh, good management? I think, I think uh, the princ principles of, of good management, as we've heard previously, are very much about collaboration and consultation across all interest parties and, and communities, and then hopefully through consensus, if not agreement, uh, to move to move forward and and manage whatever assets you have in a sustainable way, both in terms of the community, but also in terms of the environment, and that is very important. And and I, I think I think the the model of community land ownership, land based, is a really good example of how that collaboration can work in a very positive way right across the Hebrides, but also parts of mainland Scotland as well. And I think that, along with community empowerment, is going to drive this forward in a very positive way, but it has to be done in collaboration and it has to be done by consensus and it has to take account of, of the environment. And as local government, um, we're very conscious of that in terms of the environment. And we've been involved with uh, an international organisation for almost 30 years now in terms of the marine environment in particular. And that is through CHEMO, which is Communes Internationale Mill Organisation. Uh, and, and ourselves and other coastal communities, we call ourselves CHEMO UK, but in reality we are CHEMO Scotland because it's the coastal communities around Scotland that are part of that. And we've been involved in some of the things that are now in the past year being seen as really important in terms of the marine environment, and that is through through uh, blue, blue Ocean and the Sky, uh, Sky News efforts to take plastics out to the marine environment. We've been engaged in that, not because it is it is something that is going to transform our communities, but it is something that is going to prevent significant damage to our communities in the, in the future if we don't manage the, our marine assets, and that takes in the whole of the oceans as well in a sustainable way. But the focus through the current state is much narrower than that, but I still believe that the community land experience is a very positive one, and I think there is nothing to fear in terms of the accountability that goes with that, both in terms of the community landowners and those who work with them. We work with 
community land ownership partnership, in some cases with the Crown Estate, for fairly major projects. There is nothing, uh, there is nothing to fear from, from devolving that degree of control down to a local level, provided it is, it is managed in, in the way that we've already heard about. Uh, well, let me finally come to Highlands and Islands and Enterprise. And in relation to what others have said and what you might say, do you think that the bill, as presently cast, uh, adequately describes the range of responsibilities I've heard all witnesses so far articulate uh, and with which you might or might not agree? Yeah, I think that the bill um, provides a, a, a good framework around management in terms of that strategic plan requirement and also in terms of um, management plans that would need to be put in place and ensuring that there is indeed the, the forward planning and there is the accountability and the reporting back um, on, on that. And I think that's absolutely required from a, a governance point of view, whether you're um, managing a very relatively modest size asset or a very large complex asset. I think just to add to the, in terms of what good management requires, um, it's absolutely essential to have the, the knowledge and expertise in that management outfit. Um, and again, recognising the diverse portfolio of the Crown Estate Scotland asset and the range of expertise required to, to manage that, that, that I believe is, is, a, is a key requirement. Good governance is absolutely essential. And I think the, the one thing I would just also add, it's about the whole life asset management. It's looking at the management in the longer term um, and absolutely bringing in the wider uh, considerations around social and environmental is a key part of that, not just immediate financial um, gain. Uh, you, you specifically said that complex and varied environment in relation to the management skills. Given that the Crown Estate is a comparatively small organisation, is that leading us to your saying that therefore you would expect the management to be delegated to ex experts in particular areas in some circumstances without necessarily that relieving the Crown Estate of responsibility? I think that um, the expertise required um, particularly for for to see the offshore environment and that's where I'm more familiar with my energy hat on from Hells Hells Enterprise um, that it's, uh, it is a very complex environment to operate in and it not necessarily meet, needs lots of individuals, but it needs um, very knowledgeable individuals. So it's not necessarily about numbers of individuals or, or teams or resources. It's about a, a really strong understanding of um, the, the complexity of the environment and the due process that needs to be gone through. Um, now that is absolutely possible at a very local level, but also um, that expertise at a national level, I think is required in terms of the industry that they're engaging with, in terms of the learning that the industry, which is still relatively in its infancy, if I'm talking about offshore renewables in particular. Um, so that um, expertise can be quite close um, and modest in size, but needs to be very, very, very well developed. I think it's a case of, um, Horses for courses, if you like, in terms of more modest assets. And we absolutely in the Highlands and Islands have been very much advocating community ownership and community management for a number of years. Um, and very much working with partners and building um, capacity and capability in communities to absolutely very well manage local assets and realise the, the wider benefits from, from doing so. Thank you, Camilla. Supplementary to that. Uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise has um, highlighted the potential for conflict when it comes to aquaculture if a uh, local authority is both the awarder of planning permission and a receiver of revenues. Do, do you think that there is potential conflict of interest that's more wider than, that's wider than um, just aquaculture? And how do you propose that that could be mitigated? Yeah, I guess in our response, we did highlight that there is indeed this potential for conflict with a landlord then also consenting. However, I do acknowledge that already that is the case in local authorities where they may 
own the land and then also consent for um, new housing developments. So I think it's just uh, to highlight the conflict potential there, but to ensure in any structures that there is clear remits and responsibilities and, and transparency around process. Um, I think um, what I would also acknowledge is um, from early stage of leasing for, for the offshore energy market, um, going back to round three Scottish Territorial Waters and Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters leasing back in 2008-2009, that leasing activity particularly um, may have been slightly ahead of the planning process because the marine spatial planning process had not been uh, um, completed. Um, there's a lot of learning at that time <clears throat> and I do see now much greater integration between what we're looking at in terms of spatial planning and, and resource um, planning at a, um, a national level and then aligning future leasing activity to, to that. Um, that then can facilitate a more successful planning um, outcome and that's having different organisations taking that forward. Um, so again, I think it's about scale and it's about um, in certain circumstances, it will be absolutely fine to have both roles, um, but in others, it may be need that degree of separation. Yeah, I mean, just, just we, something that we've raised in, in our submission as well, and I see across a number of submissions this is highlighted. I don't think it's insurmountable, but it, uh, care needs to be taken around it. And as, uh, as Audrey McIver has stated, that it is something that a number of organisations, not least local authorities, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. They're very well equipped to do so. I think what, what, what's essential that its care is taken to ensure adequate internal separation of decision making. Uh, those two functions of, of landlord and regulator are two very different different roles. And it's very important there's, there's sort of clear separation between those two functions within an organisation. Um, in the not too distant past, Crown Estate was, was the regulator for fish farming, I'm, I'm correct. And that, that situation was, was um, sort of untenable at that time and, and, and it's changed but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a useful recent example of where where it's perhaps been something that, that's been decided needs to change but there's no reason why, why it couldn't happen in, in future um, but it, what's really important is that internal separation of decision making Go. Is there a conflict of interest with ports and harbours? We've seen a lot of controversy over ship ship or transfers, ports and harbours statutory responsibilities to the environment, but also the commercial opportunities that that would present. It, exactly, and I think they, they, they have to tackle those kind of dual roles in that sense as well. And, and I think there, there's certainly lessons can be learned from, from and that's one example. Um, there's certainly the risk there. I think you need to, 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 to really establish how successful they discharge both of those duties uh, and learn from it going forward, really. Laura McDonald. I, I think you can be on. I think, I think there is a great deal of separation. And if you go back to historically with the Crown State, the first thing that local authorities knew about uh, a consent and a lease having been given was when we had the planning application for the onshore facilities associated with that and had no say whatsoever in whether it was appropriate to have granted the lease in the first place. And that's one of the key drivers for the campaign that's been... That's been uh, worked on for many years to get more local control of the Crown Estate and the UK Government have recognised that in devolving that to the, to the Scottish Parliament and what we're seeking is that that is devolved further into, into local communities because that is where a lot of the expertise and the understanding of the impact of the marine environment is. But coming back to the, the conflict of interest, the, there is undoubtedly uh, situations where arising every day in local government where, where that conflict of interest has to be dealt with. Uh, and the important thing is that it's recognised as a conflict of interest at the earliest possible point, and then you create the separation in terms of the decision-making process. And that's what ultimately will end up with the right decision being, being taken. Local government is very well regulated in terms of its ability to do that, and, and it is something that local government is quite accustomed to. And we are also in local government, 
uh, we are harbour authorities as well as working with harbour trusts and, and others. And you couldn't find a better example than in Sulambo and in, in Scapa Flow in Orkney and Shetland, where they very ably manage that facility, which is, which is of great benefit to the whole of the UK. Given the topical and contentious nature of aquaculture consenting, um, do you not feel there's an additional, perhaps, perception of a conflict of interest there that you may have to take account of? Again, I'm not sure that that is a conflict of interest. I think there is an interest there. As local authorities, we have a, we, we have a real interest in, in the continued existence of aquaculture, particularly in our coastal communities. And we ourselves, as a local authority, have entered into voluntary management agreements with the aquaculture industry in terms of, in terms of the amount of biomass they put into a particular site. And that is in relation to what kind of site it is, whether there is a constant flow of water effectively flushing out uh, the area, and, and we have entered into voluntary management uh, agreements with the with, um, aquaculture industry on that. And I see no issue whatsoever with extending that beyond that to make sure that conflicts that arise between the aquaculture industry and other industries that use the marine environment to, to come together and have a consensus as to how to make the best out of the sustainable resource that is there. Andy Wells and then Callum McLeod. I just to, to clarify a point of process in relation to this, because Crown Estate, Crown Estate Scotland would not normally grant a straightforward lease, it would grant an option to lease prior to a, a developer or a, 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 an aquaculture property going through a planning process. So we would only grant the lease once all regulatory conditions had been met. Thank you, Camille. Just to say that there's, there's actually a, a, a broader issue that touches very clearly on, on, on the question that you, you asked there, uh, Ms Forbes, in relation to the connection or otherwise and fit or otherwise between uh, asset management and, and community empowerment and planning processes. There's a planning bill, as you know, very well aware, going through the Parliament at the moment, and there's something of a disconnect potentially there in, in relation to where communities sit with regard to having their voices heard in that regard. So I think how you connect... Um, community empowerment and, and, and how communities interact in terms of asset management and the broader kind of planning process is an important aspect in terms of how you connect, uh, make these sort of um, connections in that context, certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, Richard Lyle. Good, Vina, good morning. Um, to follow on Stuart Stevenson's question, and actually Alec Kinmouth touched on it slightly, um, the bill sets out that managers of assets must maintain and seek to enhance, enhance the value of assets and income arising but may do so in a way which contributes to a wider objective, including economic development, regeneration, social well-being, etc. Could the value of assets be interpreted in any other way than purely financial? For example, could it be interpreted in terms of the non-monetary value it provides, or could it be such as an ecosystem or a recreational health value? short answer is yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I touched on it earlier, and, 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 and actually, um, it, it seems to me clear from the evidence that the committee have received from, from, from the bill team so far that, that, that the bill as drafted does kind of interpret those terms of value and the income derived as, as in financial terms. But I think we, we and I, I know, and, and perhaps Andy Wells from Crown State Scotland could touch on this uh, from his experience, but there has been in recent years a, a big move, not just um, in Scotland, but globally at looking at value in terms of nat natural capital and, and the value that you can receive from natural heritage assets in terms of values to society around ecosystem services, clean water, clean air, provisioning uh, of, of food uh, and pollination as just a few examples. Um, and I know the Crown Estate have been an early adopter of the Natural Capital Protocol and have been um, piloting approaches on its, on its uh, rural estates um, in terms of looking at how to use the provision of ecosystem services in the decision making about how they manage the land. I think that is absolutely crucial going forward. So I think looking, I would look at the bill and say, does the bill as drafted allow for that kind of innovation to happen and continue? And I would hope that it, it does, but I think there needs to be um, some clarity about really how value is to be interpreted under this bill. Um, 
and how it, how it works with those wider societal objectives and, and towards delivering broader national outcomes, which are far wider than, than having a, a, a strong economy, which, of course, is underpinned by the environment, essentially. Anyone else? Uh, Andy Wills. In I, I would say absolutely. I would say that, um, again, adding, uh, creating value in a, in a wide variety of ways, as well as financial value is something which you know a sustainable long-term business like crown estate scotland should be aspiring to the bill creates real opportunities for for any future manager crown estate scotland or other managers to look at how they can enhance value in a wide range of, of, of different areas not just in terms of natural capital but also in terms of social uh, capital we see and we view um driving economic benefits alongside social and environment, environmental benefits very much as part of operating a sustainable business. They go very much hand in glove. You know, in terms of Crown Estate assets in Scotland, large numbers of them are in remote rural communities. Uh, we need sustainable, viable businesses operating in those areas. Uh, we need those communities themselves to be, um, to be, to be prosperous. Um, and we need the environment to support those businesses. So it's very much in the long-term interest of any manager, any business, to um, seek to enhance that value. Oh, dear, go yeah, um, At Towns and Islands Enterprise, we, we do have a relatively unique remit in terms of economic and social um, development. So very much welcome the, the move in the bill to um, look at value, not just in a monetary financial sense, but those wider wider aspects in terms of regeneration and environmental and, and social. I guess in the bill, though, what we were picking up was the must enhance the value and may take into consideration those other, um, those other factors. And it was just, I guess, to understand um, if indeed there's a hierarchy there, or indeed is it, you know, all of those factors being taken into account? And the concern that we may, or that we just wanted to alert um, the committee on is around, would those financial imperatives become the driver as opposed to the, the, the wider benefits? And sometimes those can be at odds. It could be about you know, uh, drive towards maximising the value through, um, you know, new house building and um, get the building up as quickly as possible, as opposed to thinking a longer term around um, the more energy efficiency house building and other social developments that could support that community, which might take a bit more capital investment and actually um, not necessarily be, you know, at the heart of what the, the current manager is driving. So I guess it was just through the bill ensuring that management going forward um, is not seen as secondary, if you like, in terms of those wider um, aspects. We do think that absolutely integral to the overall asset value. Uh, Carl McLeod then, Norman MacDonald. I think it's really important that um, the bill and the subsequent management of the assets does think about value in, in ways that go very much beyond simply thinking about financial value of the asset itself. Uh, and that's very much tied into some of the aspects which colleagues have, have mentioned already around the table. With regard to, uh, I mean, Mr. Stevens started the session by asking about what, what makes a good, good manager. Well, thinking about value and, and, and management of assets needs to think more widely uh, than simply the, the, the kind of financial commercial aspects of, of the asset itself. Because if you want, um, the, the management of these assets to contribute to the ways in which communities are empowered to, to, to show value, which isn't necessarily easy to do in practice in terms of measurable aspects, but can show value in a kind of qualitative way in some respects with regard to the kind of community confidence that gives, the, the, the way that kind of social cohesion is increased within communities, the way in which they have uh, more control in terms of how they're actually shaping their own natural and social environments and ways that can actually be done at the grassroots level, at community level itself, uh, that there's real, real profound actual value in terms of those processes and, and, and what that means for communities in, in a kind of sometimes more qualitative way than, than is, is the focus of pure kind of naked financial valuation of the asset itself. And that's really important in terms of thinking about the kind of cohesion of communities and the way in which managing and indeed in some aspects owning these, these assets actually makes a, a real contribution um, 
to, to these communities themselves and, and more broadly in Scotland. And let's not forget either, of course, that there's a, a national performance framework that's being reviewed uh, imminently. And although the focus is on sustainable economic growth as its purpose, there's also the addition, a welcome addition, frankly, of well-being as well. Now, that's a rather amorphous concept, but it's a very, very important concept in terms of thinking about um, how our society functions and how our communities function as well. And I think having that broader conceptualisation of value uh, in this, this, this bill, not as a hierarchy, but as something which is, has a, a more level playing field, has to be a really important uh, dimension of, of contributing, to that, contributing to that national purpose. Uh, and briefly, Norman MacDonald. Uh, I, th I thank you, Convener. There is no doubt that the socio-economic aspects of any transfer of any asset has to be has to be part of the equation. Otherwise, it just it, it just won't work. And I think that is already happening where where land, as Audrey said, land for housing is made available when local authorities are divesting themselves of some of these assets. But that has to be subject to a rigorous business case, so that what you're actually transferring is an asset and not a liability. And that would apply equally to Crown Estate assets as well, that it, it, it will be an, an asset both uh, financially but also socioeconomically. That is an absolutely vital part of the equation. Okay. I'll come down to pounds and pence, and I think most of my further questions have been answered. Thank you, Mr Lawyer. Um, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning to you all. I'd like to just pin this down, um, possibly as a final question on this, unless other uh, members want to come in. And um, you've all uh, helped with a very wide discussion of these issues in relation to financial gain, sustainable development, uh, and a whole range of other issues, and in also um, community empowerment. Uh, what I'd like to know is, um, I want to highlight something, first of all, before I ask the question. Um, that Professors Andrea Ross and Colin Reid highlighted, and they stated in their written submission, and I quote, um, uh, that Section 7.1 of the bill has a focus on narrow financial gain, and that's the end of the quote, and um, uh, they, they also stated that it may or may not be in the public interest. Now, I would really like to know your view on whether Section 7 of the bill should highlight... Um, that beyond the financial aspects, um, uh, which the managers of assets must maintain and seek to enhance, um, whether th the word may is enough for the other issues we've been discussing, or whether we should see must. Um, if, you, if you just want to give a, a one-word answer, that's great, but if you want to qualify it, then, then fine. Thank you. I'll have to answer. Uh, Alec Kenworth and then Callum McLeod. I think, very simply, achievement of sustainable development should be a requirement. And I, and I think that um, the, the submission that you've quoted is a very helpful submission that's worthy of serious consideration by the committee. Carl McLeod. I, I think it, it has to be, it must be a requirement. And, and it, it must be because sustainable development is one of these slippery terms that gets used in such a wide range of, of ways and, and, and becomes everything to everybody and nothing to know to, to anybody. Uh, that should be the overarching um, kind of framework for this. So all that kind of feeds into that, I think. Uh, very briefly, John Scott. Um, I just want to toss out the idea that with the widening of duties of managers, with uh, uh, different responsibilities being given to other bodies, such as local authorities or, or communities, um, will that not dilute... I mean, all of that will come uh, at some kind of cost. And will that not dilute the ability of the Crown Estate ultimately to yield revenues um, to the Scottish Government. Is there a balance to be struck in there somewhere? I, I see us charging down one road very much. Um, the local authorities very much um, want to have um, the benefits of the hitherto Crown Estate assets, I see. And, and I'm just wondered, will this not ultimately lead to disintegration and fragmentation of the Crown Estate? I guess potentially dilute the ability of the Crown Estate to cross subsidise the likes of the agriculture well, estates. Or yeah. to work efficiently at any yeah. rate. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody want to come in on that? Yeah, Norman. I, I th uh, thank you, Conrad. I don't think that necessarily has to, has to happen. I think, uh, I think uh, if an organisation is taking is taking responsibility for the management of an asset, they, they should also uh, be able to accrue some of the revenues and, and 
in all of the discussions so far, we've been talking about the net revenues uh, from the Crown Estate being being transferred uh, to um, to support the management of that asset in a sustainable way going forward. But I do think I do think that uh, Crown Estate Scotland will still have to retain uh, the responsibility, particularly for for the the estate that is that is land based in, in particular, but not exclusively. They will still need to retain some kind of some kind of control over that, and and we welcome some of the some of the. Uh, recommendations coming through from Crown Estate Scotland themselves and the way that they are already changing from, from the historical position. So I, I don't see that as a threat to the, to the dilution of the Crown Estate. I think it actually strengthens the Crown Estate in terms of the work that they will be doing, that there is, uh, there is a, again, a consensus on how to move forward in relation to the transfer of assets and also the revenues, uh, the revenues that go along with that. Andy Wells, on that point, and Claudia Beamish's original question. <clears throat> yes, going to Claudia's question. The may or the must thing, uh, it, it, it could be go different ways um, in certain transactions uh, where you may want to take a more commercial view. Having a must in there in terms of taking a wider perspective may cause some challenge to a decision, which could potentially become a judicial challenge to a decision which may have impact on the business. So I would, I would just urge consideration of that fact. As, 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 as that be the case that there could be a le there could be a legal challenge on anything in any bill? But why would it be the case that there would be a legal challenge if there's a must about the other aspects as well? Because this is this is the new devolved settlement for the Crown Estate. So I don't yeah. understand why you're saying that. I'm, I'm just sort of, uh, in terms of some of the decisions that um, you may be making in relation to investments or something, whether it, um, it, it, it's, it, it's possible. I'm, I'm not a legal expert, so I couldn't comment on, on, on why one may be interpreted differently than the other. But it's, the, the may, I'm not suggesting it's either one way or the other. Um, I think the, um, the, the, there is a possible consideration there. Would perhaps the example of consenting offshore wind farms be one? That might be one. Yeah. yeah. Surely, to come back on it, but surely that must take into consideration ways that contribute to wider objectives. I'm reading this out, including economic development, regeneration, social well-being, um, environmental well-being, and sustainable development. I can't see what the conflict could could be there if we're going forward in, to a Scotland which works in a way that works for sustainable development for the people of Scotland. I don't understand. I don't disagree with that. Um, as I said, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I don't see... Um, it, it just may be a consideration, that, that's all. And John Scott's point. And John Scott's point. Sorry, can you remind me that, that was on... On the sense that with all this devolution of responsibility and income to other bodies, um, what will be left for the Crown Estates to actually do? And will there be a body essentially left because it will lead to disintegration and fragmentation, um, given all of this devolution and accountability to other bodies and responsibilities, etc., communities, etc.? Again, much uh, will depend on the sort of scale and nature of the assets that are under devolved management and the needs of those assets. Uh, the way we currently work at the moment as a, as a national body, uh, managing the estate as a whole, um, it, particularly in terms of how investments are made, uh, are such that we raise capital for reinvestment from within the whole portfolio. Um, we may be selling off assets in one part of the estate to fund investments in another part of the estate. Any local manager uh, will have less scope to do that, although there is obviously the scope within the, the bill for a national framework and there is scope within the bill for ministers to uh, direct one part of the estate to, to fund another. So it, it, it could be workable. I think the, the issue potentially could be in relation to um, some of the um, opportunities that there may be to uh, cross-subsidise across the estate. Okay. I've got a lot of people wanting to, to get in. Can I ask people to be concise in their contributions? Callum and McLeod followed by Alec Kinnanmouth. I mean, one perspective on the, the bill is that it, it might, might dilute the role of the Crown Estate. Another perspective, which I think Community Land Scotland would advocate, is that actually the, the concentration of attention on, on devolution is actually a good thing in the sense that it um, adds to uh, the democratic process with regard to how um, organisations are involved in communities that are actually involved in, in managing assets, which is, is useful uh, and, and adds value in the ways we've already outlined. Okay. Alec, can I move? It's just really a supplementary on Claudia Beamish's 
original question. I mean, there, there is a duty on ministers in other legislation for sustainable development, not least the Marine Act, <clears throat> where there's a general duty on ministers to act in the best way calculated to further the achievement of sustainable development, including the protection and, where appropriate, enhancement of the health of the Scottish marine area. So, uh, Climate Change Act also has a very similar uh, duty on ministers to contribute to the achievement of sustainable development. And, and the land use strategy, which comes out of that act, must also contribute towards sustainable development. It's a very well-used term in, in Scottish legislation. And I think it comes down to that principle that, that these national assets you know, should be managed for wider public benefit. And, and, and primacy should be given to, to managing for intergenerational equity. And, and the framework for sustainable development kind of allows that to happen quite well. Audrey McIver and then Stuart Stevens has got a supplementary. Just quickly, um, from an offshore energy perspective and from an industry view, um, ease of doing business is absolutely critical, in what, which is a very, in a very complex and, as I said earlier, a relatively young industry. And those industry players are looking globally at opportunities. So from, from our perspective in terms and of trying to derive economic value from supply chain development in the offshore energy sector, um, an approach to leasing at a national level, we believe, must be maintained, um, not further fragmented. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I just wanted to return <coughs> very briefly with uh, Mr Wells only, I suspect, uh, the may versus must issue. Um, if you have must, then every single decision must, etc. Whereas there will be decisions, I imagine, uh, that are essentially neutral, where a decision has been made in the past, it has to be revisited, and you might properly conclude that you would make no change, but that is, but that is a decision. If it's May, then you can make that decision without opening up a particular hook for legal challenge, but if it's a must, Every single decision, even deciding whether you move from 80 GSM paper in the, in the corporate printers to 70 GSM papers to say paper, could be open to challenge. Is that a fair characterisation? In other words, one needs to look at every specific instance of me and must to see what the specific effects are. And one must be extremely careful in legal drafting terms. You expressed that far more eloquently than I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> go. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you want, do you want to come in? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, Alex Rowley. Could I just come back on this point? Because, this, as we said earlier, the submission for Professors Ross and Reid, they, in their submission, have suggested that the bill be amended to include a mandatory requirement for sustainable development to be taken into account. Um, and as I think, as, 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 as somebody has said, there's about 10% of the acts of the Scottish Parliament contain sustainable development provision, even though there is no legal definition of sustainable development. So can I ask, should sustainable development be defined in statute and should consideration of environmental, social and economic well-being as well as regeneration be required as subsets of sustainable development? I, I think you can I think I think that is absolutely right that that is the case. You know that uh, if you must take sustainable development into into account, then clearly sustainable development is about socio-economic issues. It's about it's about well-being. It's about all of these issues. And the and the reality is that is something that ministers have to do in in any event. So I I don't think. If you take it into account, that doesn't mean to say that it has to be a, a huge piece of work to do that, but it is something that must be considered before the final decision is taken, and that happens right across the spectrum. If you have to take it into account, you have to do that. If it's just me, then you can choose not to do it, whether it's got socioeconomic benefits or sustainable development benefits or not. OK, thank you. Uh, Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks, um, convener. Um, with regard to... Uh, national or local management, which uh, has already been, in, uh, been touched on. Um, we know that the Smith Commission recommended <coughs> that responsibility for the management of uh, those assets will be further devolved to local authority areas in the Northern and uh, Western Isles. Um, 
Now, um, Orkney Islands Council said that uh, whilst the Bill's provisions in respect of management are deemed workable, they are not considered appropriate uh, when read al alongside the, the Smith Commission. And Corna Neil and Shea indicated that the Bill should have devolved powers to Islands Councils rather than setting out a methodology uh, to enable devolution and specifically considered the case for devolution of lease management of offshore wind out to 12 nautical miles. Uh, and for aquaculture, however, um, High uh, suggested that national management of wave and tidal and offshore wind, as we've heard again today, is the preferred option of project developers and will assist in achieving the potential of offshore renewables. Uh, and it, al it also suggested it would make it simpler for industry engagement. So, um, in the panel's view, uh, d does the bill deliver the Smith Commission uh, recommendations? And if not, um, what would be required? Uh, either through uh, a change in the bill or, or other uh, action. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, well, uh, we clearly believe that uh, that infrastructure, whether that be uh, offshore renewables or aquaculture within 12 nautical miles, is something that we would w want and our communities would want some control of. Because the reality is it will be developments within 12 nau nautical miles that are most likely to have an impact on the land-based infrastructure, whether that be our, our shoreline. And, and we see that from time to time uh, due to adverse weather when, when, uh, when some I don't want to focus on aquaculture, but uh, in relation to uh, in relation to cages breaking up, that has to be dealt with. Uh, and I think there has to be some kind of uh, control of um, these uh, assets, whether they be offshore renewables or aquaculture or other industries uh, that we that we currently aren't all that clear about. Uh, we would want to have some control of that, and the communities have a significant say as to whether that development should go ahead or not, because they're the ones who are going to be most affected by it. What about the national interest? I think, I think the national interest, uh, the national interest uh, is, is something that can be part of that equation. Uh, I mean, clearly, clearly uh, there are, uh, even in terms of onshore, onshore wind developments, uh, the local authorities are not, are not the planning authority. It, it, it is the government. Uh, but as local authorities, we treat every application onshore as if we were the determining authority and make our submissions to government on, on that basis, and that is taken into account uh, by, uh, by that. But we clearly, ha as a local authority, have a significant say in, in the development, and we carry out the, the wider consultation within the community, and, and that's what enables government to make the ultimate decision. So I, I think it is important to have that local control of up to the 12 nautical mile limit. Okay. With respect, probably the two positions we've held on this issue were fairly predictable, given the, where you're coming from, and that's, that's quite understandable. What about the other panellists on this issue? I mean, what, what view would you articulate on this subject? That's th so, yeah, thank you. Um, I think from a community land Scotland perspective, we are clearly going to be in favour of uh, mechanisms that are going to ensure that um, power of managing these assets is devolved as far as possible in relation to um, the, the kind of levels of governance and, and levels of management. And, and while we welcome uh, the kind of provisions that are broadly welcome, the provisions that are contained within the bill in, in that respect. It's, it, it is important that um, where there are opportunities, uh, as, as Norman has, has mentioned there, where there are opportunities for local communities to actually have an influence and a say in terms of actually uh, managing and shaping how these assets are going to be used within the broader context, certainly of, of national interest considerations. Uh, it's, it's, it's critically important that that, that actually happens and is, 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 is made to happen within the, the legislative provisions that exist. And you'll have seen as well from our um, evidence submission that, that we have um, some other wider provisions too in relation to, to aspects of how that, that might be managed with regard to foreshore elements. And also, because it's been mentioned in other evidence sessions, I think, uh, about the the, the ownership or otherwise of, of aspects of the seabed too. So bringing it into to local consideration is, is paramount from our perspective. Alec Kermit. I, I think on the, on, on the question of, of transfer to the local level versus retaining uh, at the national on a geographic or functional basis, I think essentially we're, we're neutral on that topic. I think more 
the key consideration for us is, does the transferee have sufficient capability to discharge the duties and, and liabilities that, that come with that role? And, and, and is it subject to appropriate scrutiny? Um, I think that's, that's really key. I think um, what's proposed in the bill as a case-by-case -case approach seems to me to be appropriate, um, again, subject to sufficient transparency and scrutiny around the ministerial decisions around that. Um, I think in terms of development in the marine environment, we're, 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 we're kind of often talking about very two different roles here. There's the one aspect which this bill deals with is around the leasing of the seabed. And of course, you've got a parallel regulatory process about what actually licensing of what can happen on the seabed. Those two things are very different issues and we, they can get sometimes mixed up in, in, in discussion. I think it's worth mo noting that the Marina Act of, of 2010 it, it often gets lost in the community empowerment discussion, but it's very much aimed at community empowerment and in that planning and decision making in coastal waters was to be developed through regional marine plans developed by marine planning partnerships. And I think we're, we're a number of years down the line from the National Marine Plan being published in 2015, and, and we sit and we don't have a single regional marine plan adopted in Scotland. And I think before we start talking about transfer of assets in terms of leasing, we really need to commit to establishing regional marine plans around Scotland's coastline so that we get the, the order of things right. What do we want? What do we aim to achieve from use and development and activity in our marine environment? And then think about leasing and getting financial benefit from that. I don't think the things can happen in the reverse order. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish, briefly. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kavina, and, and indeed briefly. Uh, could I ask uh, specifically of yourself, Callum MacDonald, about um, your submission in relation to this, this whole question that we've been exploring? Um, uh, Community Land Scotland, in their written submission, uh, highlights um, where you suggest that community, uh, that ownership of land is a key driver for sustainable development. I'm wondering how that fits with um, how you would see the bill, or does indeed the bill give opportunities for that in relation to the Crown Estate? And I do, of course, understand that if something is sold, then there, there has to be sort of a, a quid pro quo or whatever in terms of assets, you know, can't just sort of sell off the Crown Estates. But um, it does go back to what um, Councillor Norman MacDonald was highlighting about the importance of community ownership. Um, and I would stress, as a South Scotland regional member, not just in the Highlands. But <laughs> well, th thank you very much for, for, for that question. It's a really, really important question. It actually gets to the nub of a, a critical issue in relation to the relationship between ownership of assets, whether they're land and other, as or other assets, and, and the management of assets. And, and certainly from a, a, a and, and some, you will get two different views on this, actually. You will get one view which suggests that it doesn't really matter who owns the asset. It's how it's managed that counts. Uh, so it's the, it's the use of the asset, and, and, and clearly that's that's very important, and that is not at all to dismiss that that perspective. Um, but ownership is is a critical element in, in many instances with regard to how the asset is is used as well and managed. So uh, having that relationship and, and recognising the relationship between um, land and or other asset ownership and the use of that ownership is, is critical in terms of the influence between the two of them. And, and if I understand the nub of your question correctly, that you're asking about the, the importance of ownership as a, as a driver for sustainable development within that. And particularly in relation to this bill, as that's what we're taking. Yes, in, in, in terms of that. Well, we, we would argue that ownership, where, where that's um, appropriate on a case-by-case -case basis, but certainly with a kind of preemptive right as well with regard to, for example, foreshore rights is, is critical with regard to that because in, in enabling communities to have ownership of, 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 of particular assets, that allows them the autonomy, uh, the, the kind of democratic process when they're community landowners to actually shape how these assets are used in practice. Now, that's critically important within the context of uh, how these communities bluntly actually thrive, survive and prosper in many cases when you have quite fragile communities. Uh, and that's important when we're thinking about this broader question about, well, is, is, is the Crown Estate going to get fragmented and, and, and what's going to be the purpose of the Crown Estate beyond, you, you know, in terms of this bill? Well, that, that's 
not even a price that has to be paid, because it's actually something that's really important to actually follow through. So um, enabling communities in appropriate circumstances to own Crown estate assets uh, is, is something which will add value in various different ways to how these communities themselves actually make themselves sustainable. And just as an, an, an added comment in relation to that, when we, we talked about kind of the legal challenges to sustainable development issues, if we're not measuring or if we're not addressing uh, any of these assets and how they're managed on sustainable development grounds, what are we actually measuring them on fundamentally? Okay. Um, Finlay Carson. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I suggested there was scope for, for the rural estates to be managed by the community where there's an aspiration, uh, a, a viable management plan and capacity to deliver. Um, so if, if the rural estates could be managed by communities, wh what is the case for this within the objectives of the Smith Commission and, and the, the bill we've got, and also in relation to tenants? Um, we've already heard that there's no appetite uh, from the tenants, the current tenants, for uh, a change in the, the status quo and no desire for them to actually become a community group to manage their own estate. So can you give us a response on that basis? Audrey McCarthy. Yeah, um, I think absolutely the point around aspiration is, is really key. It's about where there is indeed community aspiration and that's where HIE as an organisation would seek to, with partners to support and enable communities to see that through. Um, the current consultation around pilots, indeed, I think, will highlight where there is appetite or, or otherwise, and I think that you know we'll need to sort of pay due attention uh, to that. I think what in our response the context was we do see perhaps opportunities in particular local communities where subsets of the estate could be um, taken under community management and to derive all the benefits that we've already witnessed in other parts of the region. Um, but again, the distinction was in that context, yes, in the offshore context, we still believe that a very national strategic approach is required. What sort of subsets do you have in mind? In terms of um, communities where it, it could be in the context of um, small harbours or moorings, um, it could be in the context of um, la access to land and managing that land from a tourism benefit in terms of creation of recreational facilities and that the community involvement in that and the management of that um, may derive wider, wider indirect benefits than just managed um, more, more remotely or at a more national level. That's you. Rural estates, you suggested that communities could manage rural estates. Uh, is there the potential for conflict there where the tenants, current tenants, have no desire to be managed by a community and how would, how would that be resolved? How, how would you get around that issue? So to another question, I must suggest that te te tenants are separate from the, the community itself in, in terms of the, the estate, and I, I don't think they are, and I'm sure that's not, that, that's not the, the, the intention with regard to that. Um, what's, what's really important not to lose sight of, I think, in relation to whether a community would or would not take over the management or, or, or indeed ownership of a rural estate um, is something which, which Audrey just alluded to there is, is in, in terms of, of the appetite for that, but more importantly, actually, the will of the broad community of, of whom the tenants are a, a, an equal and legitimate part of that broader community in relation to whether they, they, they want to actually take on the management process or indeed the ownership process itself. Now clearly, as, we, as you, this committee knows better than most, there are, there are legal elements in terms of community right to buy, but the kind of broader principle and issue is, well, if we want to, to, to take this, the, the, this on as an asset in terms of its management, or particularly in terms of its ownership, why do we want to do that? What are the, what are the collective benefits that are achieved in relation to that, that that might not otherwise be achieved? Now, we've seen throughout um, the Highlands and Islands, not, not quite enough in the south of Scotland, but that's coming too, and certainly we've seen in the Western Isles, where uh, large estates have been taken over by communities uh, and have actually been revitalised by community ownership. 
uh, across the economic, financial, environmental and social aspects. So the kind of concept that, that communities are, are, are too small or don't have enough capacity or are unable to actually take on uh, these types of roles is frankly a misnomer and it's misguided in relation to that, but not to lose sight of your question, which is, and, and central point you make is, is, is how, how do we work out that dynamic? And I think the processes are there to enable that to happen where there's a will or otherwise to, to, to make it happen. But, but in addition to resistance, as, as Finlay Carson has touched on, from tenants to this, would it not be the case that when a community looked at a rural estate and looked at the liabilities around some of the tenant farms, the maybe backlog of repairs, whatever, they would just shy away from this in reality? Well, that, that, that can be the case, of course. And, and, and I'm, I'm wearing a, a Community Land Scotland hat today in, in terms of this, but my, my other hat is in relation to, um, for what about phrase, consulting on sustainable development issues with communities themselves. And part of that process is around how you... You, you manage and think about liabilities and, and potential assets that you might want to manage your own in relation to that. But if we're talking about the public interest and the common good, actually, with regard to um, the sustainable development of communities and the sustainable management of assets, there's some really important questions to be addressed as well with regard to how we actually manage liabilities. And I noted when I was going through the previous evidence sessions so that there was some discussion with uh, Scottish government officials with regard to the liability element there and how that might be managed. So I think there's something potentially imaginative or at least progressive to be done with regard to that, which might help communities um, engage with, communi with, with asset management in ways which, which uh, contribute to their sustainability, but also add to the kind of broader common good and public good. Norman MacDonald. Uh, just very briefly, uh, I think the reality is if there is no appetite in a community, whether they be tenants or not, uh, and if, even if there is an appetite and they start looking at the business case for it and it turns out to be a liability rather than an asset, it just won't happen. And as Callum said, although many parts of the, the Outer Hebrides are under community ownership, there are pockets, uh, significant pockets, that are not for that very reason. So, so there, is no, there is no imperative there. There is no forcing that. It is entirely at the community, whatever community that is, uh, is it's, at their, it's at their doorstep, as it were. John Scott, briefly. I just would like to ask, um, Committee, if you think that there would be the capacity or indeed the expertise within local communities to manage the, the land portfolio of, of the Crown Estates, uh, for my part, I'm not certain that there would be, but I'm interested to hear where you think that would lie. Callum McLeod. It, it will depend clearly in relation to uh, the particular context of, of, of the estate itself and whether the community is in, in a position to do that. But that is not to dismiss um, very large, as I've alluded to already, very large scale examples of, of communities that have taken on very large estates and have managed them very successfully. I mean, Stor is, is, is a classic example of that uh, with regard to a community landowner which is now involved in multi-partnership, multi-million pound uh, regeneration schemes with regard to uh, that asset itself, that land asset itself and, and, and what it's doing. So, so whether uh, a community would wish to actually take on um, the management of one of the, the, the Crown Estate real estates is, is something which uh, we'd have to be determined in terms of what, what their um, will for that is and also their capacity with regard to that. Um, but that, to, to kind of suggest that that's not feasible, I think, would be to dismiss the potential of, of the capacity and, and, and roles which, and expertise which committees may have in, a, in order to actually enable that to happen. So it will vary for different contexts, clearly, but I, I wouldn't rule that out as a, as a principle to think about, certainly. Interested to hear the views of others? Briefly. In the, in the context of, again, managing the assets as they stand, either as a whole portfolio or as part of a sort of fragmented management structure where you potentially have different managers operating different parts of the rural estates, there are clearly some chat would be challenges in there in terms of how um, certainly capital investment would be accounted for. I've alluded previously to the fact that we often have to sell property in one estate to invest in another. There are a number of uh, overall 
um, liabilities are associated with management of certain properties that aren't attached to another that we have to plan for and manage. Um, so any form of... It's not to say, as has been clearly um, said, that it can't be done, but there will be some potentially practical issues in terms of how that, would, that ongoing investment would, would be continued. Can I take the opportunity to answer a couple of questions I didn't uh, get a chance to previously? Yeah, if you could briefly. Yeah. Right, just in relation to the sale of assets, uh, under the terms of the bill, any manager is able to sell and, and buy assets. The key thing is that the capital that is derived from those assets is reinvested in land and property, which is within the terms of the Act. So that's something that could happen to, of sale of foreshore or, and is happening in certain circumstances in terms of asset sales to communities. And going back to the strategic national infrastructure, clearly there is a case for, particularly offshore wind and marine environment, cables and pipelines for um, ministers to continue to wish a strategic approach. But I would also highlight, not just in terms of that asset, but also the rural estate, that the, the views of tenants is absolutely critical. We, we operate, obviously, in a business environment. We have um, a, you know, very uh, strong relationships working with future business and tenants in terms of unlocking potential and the importance of the views of tenants should not be underestimated. Very briefly, um, one of the arguments, for just come back to, to, to Mr Scott's question, uh, one of the arguments, the central arguments for community land ownership is that it is responsive to communities' needs and helps to shape them. Now, just, just from the, the, the previous evidence sessions, it, it doesn't sound as if it's all milk and honey necessarily, even with the Crown estate at the moment. I was very interested to hear what uh, Mr Brian Shaw had to say from the Applegarth estate, where he said uh, there are many underlying problems about which tenants are honestly frightened to go to the Crown estate. There are some houses that need a lot of work. Uh, there are some capacity issues there, and so, some issues around resolving uh, the, the kind of social conditions, perhaps, in which maybe tenant farmers and other folk are in, 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 t in terms of these estates. One of the reasons that the Ulva buyout has been successful in terms of getting um, approval from government is that there's a real uh, agenda there and a business plan around refurbishing and renewing that island in terms of its housing, and, and by that, it's kind of social fabric. Now, there's no, no way uh, that it's appropriate, I would suggest, to dismiss the potential of communities to replicate that type of, of process elsewhere, but on the rural estate and elsewhere. To your point, then, if the amount of money that was available uh, to these communities was also available to the Crown Estates to carry out these social purposes, absolutely admirable and necessary, then they too would be have the ability to carry them out, would they not, in terms of refurbishing housing? They would, they, they would potentially have the ability to carry them out if they, if they made those management decisions to do that. What you would find at a community level is their actual commitment to do that, that, that that's clearly there. And in the process, actually from the, the grassroots and, and, and the community level itself, enabling the communities to make the decisions with regard to that, which uh, certainly from a community land Scotland perspective is, is, is not an invaluable thing to do. Uh, Philly Carson. Very briefly, given it currently that the, the, the well-performing rural estate in some way subsidises the less well-performing, if, if a community was to, to look at the economic viability of a good part of the state, would the recognition need to be given to the impact of the fragmentation of the good bit on, on the, the less sustainable parts of the estate, would that would have to be recognised as the whole portfolio? So actually uh, fragmenting the, the viable parts of an estate which could be uh, devolved down to communities and, and what would the impact would be on the less viable parts of the, the rural estate? A, a, a kind of measured decision in terms of what the actual value is across the different elements that we've been discussing already with regard to uh, transfer of ownership in that context. So whether there are community benefits, economic and social environmental benefits associated with, with um, ownership from, from one aspect of the estate or, 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 or several, which, which um, on, on balance would, would create a, a kind of public interest argument to, to, to do that, basically. So... I'm not suggesting for one second that it's, it's, it's a straightforward process. All I am suggesting is that uh, it would be a missed opportunity to dismiss that as a principle to actually be incorporated. On that note, we'll move on. Donald Cameron. Thank you, Can I uh, refer to my register of interest as a landowner in the Highlands? Um, I'd like to ask about pilot projects. Um, the various island authorities that I've spoken to 
uh, have shown a real enthusiasm for pilot projects. Uh, and they're very keen, um, putting it frankly, to, to get on with it um, and have been for quite some time. Is the panel satisfied that sufficient progress has been made in respect of pilot projects? Yes. Can you, uh, thank you. Um, so certainly from, from our point of view and, and Orting and Shetland as well, the three island authorities are very clear uh, about wishing to uh, progress with that. The consultation for uh, consultation on the, on the pilot process has only just concluded and, and that will take uh, some time before we, uh, before we get the you know the, the submissions that have gone in in relation to that, but we certainly see uh, um, a real importance in taking forward pilot uh, uh, projects, and and from the discussions we've had with our colleagues in in Orton and Shetland, their pilot projects will be different to the ones we have, and and uh, we're quite well sighted on what we want our pilot project uh, to be about, and it is about. It is about the Crown Estate assets. Uh, it is about uh, the Crown Estate assets out to the 12 nautical mile, and it is about working with uh, with, the, with the capacity the community can bear. And we have really clear evidence of that, as Calum's already said, through community land ownership. Community land ownership, in principle, is not a great deal different to ownership of the, the marine assets that already contribute a significant amount to these communities, and it's about giving local management and local control and local revenues that can be used to be reinvested in making, in making facilities that enable that uh, to go further. So I think uh, we would see our pilot projects hopefully as, as a starter for 10 uh, in that we can demonstrate through the pilot project that there is the capacity, there is the wish to do it and, and the safeguards are in place in terms of of how the process is taken forward in, in a regulatory framework, but also, more importantly, in terms of local management. And I think that's where the biggest, uh, where the biggest gains will come from in relation to the Crown Estate. Anyone else on the panel? I'd like to comment on the pilots in terms of the progress. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, it's something that uh, the, the, the Crown Estate Scotland and the board have been very keen to pursue. Um, we've got to bear in mind we're only a year old. We've had a, 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 a huge focus this year on getting the business up and running um, following the transfer from the Crown Estate. Uh, immediate financial cash flow difficulties were, were a huge priority. We've got to get a, how to get a corporate plan in place, uh, which has been done. Uh, the board has got to settle in and understand the assets, and as soon as it was practicable, the, 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 the drive to develop the pilot programme has been taken forward. The board have been visiting, as have staff, um, very many councils to understand um, their, their, their aspirations uh, and the consultation process, as has been said, has just been completed. There's an expectation that following that, um, that the first sort of pilots uh, applications could come through in June later this year. It's a two-stage process um, and following the responses from the consultations, we hope to refine that and, and get that up and running as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, Mark Roskell. Thank you. Can I ask the retention of net revenues by asset managers and the, and the reinvestment into the asset. We've had, um, you're probably aware of the evidence we've had around this 9% figure, which I don't fully understand what the, the, the methodological basis is to that. Um, but, but you've all put in, I think, some quite strong views on, on this point. So can, can I explore that? And in, in particular, if you've got any uh, views on what the methodology should be around redistribution, how do we, how do we actually calculate that? Could I perhaps could clarify? If we could start with Andy Wilson, yeah, a yeah. clarification would be useful. Yes. I'd, I'd like to get views from I think this members. comes back, back to the way in which um, Crown Estate Scotland has to separate its revenue account from its capital account. The capital um, is part of the uh, ownership uh, under the crown of the asset itself and is retained as such. Uh, and any capital raised from sales, or as I mentioned, gets reinvested in, into the estate. Um, from that capital, under the terms of the Crown Estate Act and under the terms of the, the bill going forward, uh, any manager needs to turn that capital into account through generating revenue from it. That revenue, um, minus costs of securing that revenue, is then surrendered to, to Scottish Government. Um, before doing so, uh, under the terms that were uh, of the previous legislation, 9% of that revenue can be moved 
into the capital account, and it's normally calculated on the basis of the previous year's turnover. So it's gross turnover, 9%, can be moved into the capital account, which creates an opportunity for the business to use that capital for reinvestment in the, in the asset. Um, so that clarifies how it actually works. In the current year, because we don't have operating accounts for last year, not being Crown Estate Scotland, there's still ongoing discussions with Scottish Government as to how that 9% will be uh, determined. Okay. Yeah, I admit to not being very clear as well around the, the, how the 9% was derived, but thank you for that clarity now. Um, I think in our submission, we even went as far as offering an, a, a top up of that 9% for particularly for community organisations. Um, I think we're not necessarily advocating a specific number. But I think what we um, are very mindful of is, you know, what is the incentive um, from a financial point of view? Um, uh, taking on board all the other comments that we've said around incentive is not all, only about the financial, but for community organisations having to undertake good and proper management of the asset, it, you know, is that sum sufficient? And I think that's just really, really flagging up that we, we need to understand indeed if that is the case and perhaps from the pilot process as well that we'll, we'll get a bit more of a, uh, an understanding of that. Measure and evaluate that incentive. That comes back to sustainable development again, does it? So this is about the clear objectives about what we're trying to reinvest in and what we're trying to deliver for communities. Yes. Okay. Can I get some more views, please? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Camille. I, th I don't think there's any doubt that we would prefer to, to uh, refer to the, the first minister's statement in I think it was 20, 2015. Uh, where uh, the First Minister stated that 100% of the net revenues would be, would be returned to, to the communities in which these revenues were, were generated. Uh, and I, and I, I recognise that, uh, that there is still quite a lot of complexity about the distribution, and I think that's something that needs to be a major focus on in, in the very near future. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be difficult to set the parameters for how the pilot schemes even can be taken can be taken forward, and I think that is something that 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 will have to be resolved with much greater clarity than than is there at the moment uh, before things can move forward. And I think that's a key thing uh, for us to to be addressing both in terms of communities who aspire to uh, take uh, control and management of the assets, but also in relation to the Crown Estate themselves. There are fundamental issues there that that need to be. Resolved in the very near future in relation to distribution. Callum McLeod, briefly on, on that point, would you see part of this reinvestment being reinvestment in your capacity as a council to actually manage assets? So, to come back to you know, Audrey McKeever's points around needing, you know, con ensuring consistency and professionalism among asset managers when it comes to renewable energy development and leasing. Presumably, there are gaps that councils have. So, w would you see this reinvestment as being reinvestment in your council teams to be able to to deliver this, or is it about community benefit in a wider no, sense? Not necessarily. I mean, we already have teams within local authority, as as you just stated, that that okay. that, that manage marine assets of of different types. What we want to see is that that uh, the the net revenue that comes from the management of these assets goes back into the communities, and for them to to, to decide to a large extent what that is, what that investment is about, whether it's about infra onshore infrastructure, whether it's about managing the asset in terms of persuading those who are involved in the various, whether it be aquaculture, for them to manage their process in a way that is sustainable within within that within that local context. Uh, certainly, we have no wish to to, uh, to be seeing that money. Being, that there is no benefit if the net revenues are coming from the county state to local government. We're not interested in using that to deliver our services. We're looking for that investment to go into the county state, something that hasn't happened historically, and that's what communities are crying out for. That's where we see with focus. But we need to be clear about this, the, the distribution formula. Devolution of management puts pressure on your teams. I think I think uh, the greatest pressure on these teams is their inability to deliver the aspirations of local communities in terms of in terms of the financial resource they have. Okay, um, Cam. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ruskell. I mean, the nine percent figure is, is a, 
a curious and intriguing one in some respects because it seems to have been not, not plucked out the air, certainly, but it's a historical figure. So I'm not quite clear as to the, 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 the rationale for that specific figure itself. It's because the Crown states can't borrow money. So there has to be a methodology by, 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 by which it can generate capital for reinvestment other than through sales of land. OK, thank you. That's very helpful in terms of clarifying that. Um, that being the case, nevertheless, uh, th there is certainly an issue a a around the incentivising of communities, if you like, to actually become managers of, of, of assets themselves in relation to that, and whether there is indeed scope to uh, raise, or certainly change that figure. Now, I don't, we don't have a, a figure in mind either, but certainly something which is going to help in order to do that. And it was interesting as well, when David Malin gave his evidence to yourselves on 20th of February, I think it was, uh, he talked about, he said, 9% is a game changer for communities. Well, maybe it is, certainly. Not, that's not to dismiss that in relation to what it is, but uh, it could be even more of a game changer, frankly, if, if, it's, if it's a larger figure. And there's also an interesting question as well with regard to what happens to that 91% that goes back into the, the Scottish Consolidated Fund itself. Now, I took from Mr Mallon's evidence that there was some ambiguity as to whether there was scope to actually redirect uh, that from the fund back into communities themselves. And if that is the case, then certainly would be very interested to hear how that might happen in practice. OK, um, let's uh, kind of wrap up question here. If I can pose this to all of you, I'm looking for brief answers. Do you have any views on potential emissions from the bill or suggestions as to how it should be amended, other than the ones we've already highlighted. Carl McLeod. Uh, we we have a couple of suggestions with regard to um, areas where, where we think there are opportunities, and, and, and one of those relates to uh, a kind of not a kind of an automatic. Uh, right of ownership of, of the foreshore and where that's not the case for communities who aren't in a position to, to do that, they would, it would go to, to local authorities um, and. and enable them to, to communities then to, to, to take that on. Uh, we also have made a suggestion and a written evidence with regard to uh, the scope for um, ownership of uh, areas of the seabed for communities that are um, within the pr proximity of foreshore rights as well. And again, that just without rehearsing all the arguments we've heard already, that's around issues about sustainability and community cohesion in, in, in relation to that. Just briefly, in real terms, what would be the benefits of both of those? Uh, th those options, oh, yeah, they would give communities uh, more control and more say in relation to what they might actually want to do with the assets themselves for the, the benefit of, of, of the, those communities. So there would be potential economic benefits. Uh, there would be the kind of other broader sustainable development benefits in terms of, uh, kind of social cohesion, co community confidence, helping to actually thrive in relation to that. Just before to bring in Alec, kind of Andy, Andy Wills, how would you see that working in practical terms, given your inside knowledge of the Crown Estate? Yes, I think I mean it's about a balance at the end of the day, and and and, and from our perspective, you know, we see the the bill offering a real opportunity for for more people to have more opportunities to be getting involved in management of the assets, for more communities to be uh, having a say in in in, in how they manage, um, and equally, um, you know, it is that balance about empowering these communities while striking the right balance with accountability and having the right systems and things. Uh and I'm not going to be unfair and ask you if you can see the bill being improved, given that you're here representing the Crown Estate. That would perhaps be a bit, bit un unkind. Alec Kinnaman. Um, just in addition to the things we've already discussed, of course, and sticking on that seabed ownership issue, I think it's very recognised that the territorial seabed of Scotland is, is it's clearly, we can all agree, of national importance, and, and that's why we're quite happy to support the presumption against the, the disposal of that asset without, without safeguards. I think that there is certainly... Um, Given that there's quite strong consensus around that presumption, there's, there's scope to make the bill slightly stronger, I believe. I think that it's currently at the discretion of ministers to, to consent disposals of seabed under the bill is drafted against an unknown set of criteria. Um, either we, we're clearer on what those criteria can be or we, we make the seabed effectively inalienable, uh, unable to be sold and, and give a greater role for Parliament in deciding when and where it should be sold. Uh, Audrey McIver. 
Uh, yeah, I think in taking it from a, an industry and sector development perspective, if the bill, whilst acknowledging further devolution, could also illustrate how Crown Estate Scotland um, would continue to play a, a vital role in stimulating innovation and support of, of technology and development, whether that's in um, offshore energy or indeed in aquaculture. Okay. Norma Macdonald, finally. Uh, thank you. I, I, think, uh, I think the point that was raised by Alex in relation to uh, the ministerial discussion, I think some clarity on the criteria of that would be, would be uh, hopefully, uh, it, it would be reassuring for, for those of us. And there is no doubt that in terms of the, the, um, the Crown Estate assets, um, no community is going to take, take on the management of Crown Estate assets if there is no benefit to them in doing that, and nobody is going to take on the management of an asset if it is not an asset and it's a liability. And it's and it's about making sure that there are safeguards in place uh, to to ensure that the pr a process whereby people take control and management of assets and the revenues that go with it are are very clear and and are regulated at all kinds of different levels. Thank you, and thank you all for your evidence this morning. That's been very useful. I'm going to suspend for a couple of minutes before we move on to the next item. Thank you very much.
Uh, welcome back. The uh, third item of business, uh, business on our agenda this morning is to hear from Scottish Water and Business Stream on the organisation's 2016-17 annual reports and accounts. We're joined by Joanna Dow, the Chief Executive of Business Stream, Peter Farrer, the Chief uh, Operating Officer, Douglas Milliken, the Chief Executive, uh, Professor uh, Simon Parsons from Scottish Water and Dame Susan Rice, who is the Chair of both Scottish Water and Business Stream. Uh, we'll move straight to questions. Uh, John Scott. Um, good, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, can I ask the first question and ask you what measures have been taken uh, to improve Scottish Water's customer service record in recent years, and how can this be sustained? Bit of an overview and ask Peter to, to comment. So we have, there are two key things that we focus on, both the, um, the physical service and performance that we deliver, so the quality of water, environmental protection, minimising interruptions to supply, trying to minimise instances of sewer flooding, but also the experience as viewed by customers. How do they feel about the service uh, in that regard? And what I'm very pleased to be able to say is having now completed 2017-18, as well as the year under review today, that we've continued on a forward and positive trajectory. But I'll allow Peter to elaborate. OK, thanks, Douglas. So um, if we start with the, the physical measures of customer service, we have a, a measure called uh, OPA, which is the Overall Performance Assessment, which covers 17... Uh, individual measures which are all weighted and these measures um, are weighted to reflect uh, the importance to customers of these particular measures and as Douglas said it covers various things water quality environmental performance flooding pressure interruptions to water supply leakage etc 17 different measures that are important to customers um, in the 2015 to 21 uh, business plan, we set a target of uh, reaching over 382.5 points on average. Um, now, that level was set, uh, which represents the threshold above which would be recognised as leading performance in the UK. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that in the 16-17 uh, year, we achieved 398 points on that OPA measure. Uh, which is um, a notable uh, improvement on the target of 382.5. Uh, this year we're continuing with that uh, improvement and although the numbers aren't finalised yet, we've continued uh, to improve and the number is looking like it will be over 400 uh, for this year. And just to give you an indication of the journey we've been on in that, when that measure was first introduced back uh, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, we were benchmarked as the, the worst performing company in the UK, and we've now moved that on to be recognised as uh, one of the leading companies in the UK. The second uh, customer service measure, the more experiential one that Douglas talked about, um, we call the household customer experience measure. Um, and it's a combination of qualitative and quantitative measures, um, again, which represent things that are important to customers. So it includes the number of contacts we get from customers, abandoned calls in our contact centre, complaints, both uh, single first-tier complaints and second-tier complaints from the Scottish Public Sector Ombudsman, um, customer experience score, and also some perception measures uh, from customers who maybe don't transact with us on a regular uh, basis. Uh, again, uh, this year, well, when we started this two years ago, we set, uh, we had a target of 82.6 points for this measure, uh, and in 1617, uh, we achieved 85.8 points, uh, which represents a 20% improvement in that measure since we Im implemented it um, two years ago. Uh, and this year we're on a similar trajectory um, to improve the, the measure further. Uh, and over the three years since we've implemented this, it will represent a 22 to 25% improvement. I think maybe if I could just pick on a couple of the important measures within that. Um, so cus um, yep. so uh, complaints, for example, is one of the, the important measures within that. Um, and in the 16-17 year, we saw a 20% reduction in the number of complaints from the previous year, uh, and that this year is looking like a 40% reduction over a two-year period. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, 
Can I ask a further question? What is Scottish Water's approach uh, to handling the sensitive community matters referred to by uh, Chief Executive Douglas? The <clears throat> Scottish Water, on a, on a daily basis, is operating in communities across the length and breadth of uh, the country, just in terms of our daily operations and, and services. Perhaps uh, the most uh, in intrusive aspect that we have in communities is when we're going about our capital investment programme. And probably at any one point in time, there are two or 300 projects uh, running live in communities uh, across uh, Scotland. I think this is an area where we have made enormous strides, but there's still more we can do. So we now work actively with communities when we are looking to embark on a project to look at how can we maximise the level of community involvement in what we do, how we do things, or when we do things. So, for example, if we're maybe doing a, a, an infrastructure project uh, around a, a primary school, how can we try and coincide the traffic flows so it has minimal impact on people going to and fro uh, school? So that's a general uh, position uh, that we're in. Clearly, when we are doing so much work in, in communities, we don't always get it right. And I think the first thing to, to say is that when we do uh, create uh, sensitive communities is to recognise that, look at what we need to do in that specific situation to uh, recover it and, and make progress, but crucially all the time, what insights can we get from that to learn and build into processes to improve what we do uh, going uh, you forward. So to give a, a very live example relative to the, the, the capital city, we've got a, a, a very significant project we're doing in the Haymarket area of Edinburgh, just opposite Haymarket Station, where we're expanding the size of the sewer there to take away the risk of sewer flooding from some of the businesses in Haymarket Terrace. But in that area alone, there are half a dozen different communities that we've had to engage with, whether that's businesses there, whether that's households, whether it's households in the adjacent area where traffic's being diverted, whether it's people using the train station, cyclists and so on. So the whole notion of community engagement is a very multifaceted one um, that all the time we're seeking to get better at. Can I get, look at another perhaps example of that, which was the massive infrastructure project in Glasgow that Angus MacDonald and I visited um, some time ago. Was it not the case that there was a delay in completion in that which led to inconvenience for some of the businesses in the area? Probably a few things, if, if I could tease out that. So I think, uh, Convene, you're referring to the Shield Hall uh, Tunnel Project, which is the largest uh, project we're running at the moment. It's uh, about £120 million investment in putting in a new three-mile sewer uh, underground of, of nearly five metres in diameter. It's a huge uh, project. And, and again, it's a good example of many different uh, communities. So I, I remember uh, you go, going out there many times and seeing how close the physical infrastructure, getting you know, piling rigs as high as the ceiling from here, literally feet from people's houses, and seeing the way that the team had engaged so constructively with the local community and kept them bored, I think was really tremendous. I think the aspect that you're referring to was that there were some businesses in, in, in one of the areas affected by traffic diversions, where with the benefit of glorious hindsight and probably in our, in our great enthusiasm, we were too quick to commit the date by which we would be out of that area. And I think as we do more and more complex infrastructure work in city areas, our understanding is growing that actually it's often more complex than perhaps our, our, our ambitious engineers' uh, first estimate or, or hope, because sometimes it's what you find when you go underground. So if I take my Haymarket example, as we've gone in there, we found old tram tracks from the trams that were lifted in the 1950s. We have found other uncharted services. So you get surprises when you go underground. So I think with hindsight, we, um, we promised the businesses that we'd be out too quickly. But as a way of a contrast to that, one of the other aspects of that project has been having to close Aitken Head Road in Glasgow to do major sewer work associated with it. And I was absolutely delighted when we could announce last week that we were out of there early. So I think that's a good example of how we've tried to learn from perhaps aspects of the project where we'd overpromised uh, earlier. But to come back to your original question, overall the project is running actually ahead of schedule and we're hoping the tunnel will be operational uh, early in the summer. 
which is all very well and good, but in, in a situation where your work has had a negative impact on those businesses, did you compensate those businesses? We, as a, as a matter of principle, recognising that we are a public body and all our money comes from households and business customers across the country, we do not compensate uh, uh, you know, customers uh, for delay. Our, our challenge is to seek to minimise the interruptions on customers and to try and give businesses as much notification as possible of any impact. But if fundamentally, uh, if our business model was one where we were compensating the specific businesses affected across the country, that would have an upward impact on the charges that everybody across Scotland would have to pay. So I guess it's a matter of policy that we don't compensate. Mm. Can I just return to something that's in the written evidence? And, and it's maybe an obvious point, but I want to get it on the record. It states that written customer complaints fell by 30% in 2016-17. Does written customer complaints include emails? Yes, it does. It does, because one wouldn't have been surprised to see letters yeah. fall by that number in this day and yeah. age. OK, thank you. It's good to get that on the record. Um, moving on, um, Richard Lyle. Good morning. Um, I've got two questions. On page 13 of your Shaping the Future report, you've gone about your charging basis. We support the continual use of council tax bans as a basis for setting household customer charges, as it's simple, cost-effective, and also provides a level of fairness. Can I ask you, are water charges the same for every household in the A&H council tax banding? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure if I understood the final bit of the question. Right, I'll be very precise. Are the charges for each house in bands A through to H the same? Right. OK, so let me just give a, a bit of context behind the question, then it's a specific... So I think you're referring to our document, which is setting out um, our, our consultation on what we see as the long-term future for Scottish Warden services that we're delivering to our customers. And this uh, document, both in terms of its uh, document form, in terms of an online version, is open for consultation and customer views right across the next six months. We're going right around the country trying to engage customers and get their views about what they want from Scottish Water in the future. But turning to the very specific question, the, uh, the council tax charges are the same in any individual band, irrespective of where you live in, in Scotland. So if you live in... I asked you. No, 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 sorry, just, I'm just coming. So, so in, in, in band A, it's the same wherever you are in Scotland, and in band H, it's the same wherever you are in Scotland, and all points in between. And the relationship of the charging structure between band A to band H is exactly the same as the historical basis that's been used for council tax in Scotland until the change was made recently to increase the band E to H for council tax. That's not what I asked you. What I asked you was, if I pay uh, uh, £300, I'll, I'll take a figure out there, if I pay £300 in band A, is it £300 for every house in the country? Or is it £300 for band A and £370 for band H? So it is, it is um, £300 for every... So I'll, I'll give you the, the, the a, actual sorry, figures. Sorry, can I, can I just stop you? I want a precise answer to a precise question. Is the charge, water charge, for every house in Scotland the same? No. No, thank you. Right, I'll move on. I, I thought that, but I just wanted to make sure. Um, so, Scottish Water is publicly owned. We, the public, effectively, are your shareholders, yes? Yes. So, given Scottish Water currently made um, £94.2 million pounds in their current financial situation, is there scope to reduce the charges and make every house, every house the same in Scotland to pay the same in Scotland? You know, uh, if I live in a band A house, I'll pay £300. And if I live in a band H house, I pay £300. Because we're all drinking the same water, we're all using the same facilities. So why is there a difference? And if, um, taking on board that you have made this profit, and I know you're going to say, oh, we have to do these projects, and we've got to pay for this, and we've got to pay for that. Can you reduce your fees to local councils and to local households to make everybody the same? 
Or can you, in fact, dare I say it, and councils will love this one, through uh, some councils, or most councils collect water charges through their household bills, could you increase their fees? Right, I think there's a, a number of different um, elements there. The first thing to say that the principles by which we charge are set by ministers for every six-year regulatory period. So the, the charging structure linked to council tax bans was set in late 2014 to apply for the 2015 to 21 period. So Scottish Water implements ministers' policy on, on charging. That's the first point. Second point, in terms of the activities that we do and how we finance them. In very simple terms, there are two things that we do. One of which is that we deliver the day-to-day -day service providing the clear, fresh drinking water, taking away wastewater and safely treating that and returning that to the natural environment. There's a cost to that. And the second thing is the cost to is all the investment that we do, and that investment is broadly into two categories to repair or to replace infrastructure or assets that have come to the end of their lives, and secondly, to enhance or to extend our networks. Now, in very simple terms, the total cash cost of delivering all our operations and all our investment is more than the revenue that we generate, and that's why we borrow from the Scottish Government to part finance our investment programme. So, in simple terms, if we were to drop the charge levels then effectively the level of borrowing would need to go up. But these are not our decisions. These are done through an independent regulatory process that's a, a reflection of an act that was passed in this parliament in 2005, where the economic regulator has a duty to set our charges at what's termed the lowest reasonable overall cost for us to deliver our services. Yeah. Every, every, company, you know, every com company in the world if they make a loss or a profit or the, the an, a, a expenditure, etc. Right. So if, if, I, if I'm a shareholder of a, a company, I used to work for the Royal Bank of Scotland. I was a shareholder of the Royal Bank of Scotland. I sold them before the crash, by the way. But the physical situation is that as a, as a, a shareholder, you have made a profit, even with all your costs, your uh, uh, spending out, you made a profit of £94 million. Pounds. So, as, as a shareholder, should I not get some of that back, as shareholders do uh, with other companies to get a dividend? And, and effectively, my answer to that would be say, in the model that we have, you get it back in the form of that being reinvested in the infrastructure to keep delivering services uh, for uh, the future. So my, my dividend's paying for, for, for future projects? It is to keep delivering the services effectively into the future. OK, thank you very much indeed. Mark Roscoe. Uh, just to that, there's always the uh, possibility of local government tax reform, uh, you know, sitting there and waiting in the wings at some point in the future. Uh, how close do you see the, the charging methodology linked into that? So it, do you see it as a completely separate debate to where we take council tax forward? Or would you anticipate a, a review of the charging methodology to take place automatically if there was a review of... Uh, council tax and, and, it, and its uh, potential replacement. So. so, I mean, two or three thoughts on that. I mean, I think, it, I mean, I come back to it's fundamentally an issue for, for ministers. Um, and clearly, I guess, to the extent that they think about changes in, in, in local government taxation, then there is a, a flow through thinking about what happens with, with water. But what I would say, one of the, I think the great benefits of the current system is how efficient it is for billing and, and collection, where the costs of the billing collection activity are shared between the local authorities and ourselves, and that effectively helps to keep down council tax and water charges. Right, okay. Right. So there questions in this. In terms of investment in new development, so, you know, we have a planning bill going through Parliament just now. There is a need to see major investment in housing. So take a housing estate being proposed, 900 houses. Does Scottish Water uh, claim some of that investment back from the developers or do you have to invest in the infrastructure yourself? Being one question and my second question is is the level of investment that you're putting in keeping up with the level of demand for investment in infrastructure or are we storing up problems for the future? Okay, um, 
I'll, I'll probably take them in reverse order. I, we are absolutely endeavouring to be what we would term ready just ahead of need. So we don't want to be creating infrastructure that may ultimately not be rely, required because that effectively would be a, a, what we call a, a stranded asset and really a, a sunk cost for us as a business. But equally, we don't want to be late and holding up new development. So our strategic aim is to be ready just ahead of need. We've made a lot of progress on the last few years working with developers and local authorities to try and get ourselves, and generally we are largely in that position. Turning to the whole question of, of who pays for uh, what, so there is a model at the moment, which is in very simple terms, is a shared cost model. We pay part of it and developers pay part of it. There's quite a bit of intricacy as to precisely how that works. But one of the questions that we're posing in our consultation is for the future, is that balance right? So do we have the right balance between what existing customers pay and what developers and new customers pay for the cost of new investment? And could I just come back on that, that one point, which was, are we storing up problems for the future or is the level of investment in infrastructure to repair infrastructure, uh, is that level of investment, are you satisfied that, that we are meeting the pressure on the infrastructure generally, or are we... More, gener more generally. Yes, more generally, no, or are we still not I problems? mean, I, th I think it's a very, very topical question, because we're spending a, a lot of time with all our regulators at the moment thinking about the next price review from 2021 and beyond, and probably the... The biggest issue that we're grappling with is the asset replacement challenge. So we've spent a, a lot of time in Scotland over probably the past 20, 25 years investing very significantly in upgraded infrastructure and assets, putting in place wastewater treatment plants where there weren't before. And the big question for us as we look into the decades ahead is when will we need to replace that infrastructure? At one level, the challenge for us is how can we sweat the assets, make them last as long as possible, but equally have a good understanding of when we'll need to replace so we have the financial capacity to do that? And that's a live issue under review as we're going through and working on our 2021 price review. Okay, let's, let's move on to um, business stream. Uh, when you were last in front of the committee, we had a discussion about um, the concerns that some of us had around your 14-day billing period for customers, when in fact... Uh, you had a longer period for paying your own creditors. Now, there was an undertaking subsequently given that that would be looked at and a 21-day period introduced for new customers. Can I ask if that has been done and, and what impact that's had? Yeah, certainly. When I wrote to you to provide additional evidence after the committee, we made a commitment then that we'd move to 21-day payment terms, not just for new customers, but for any customer that wasn't on a contract with us. Um, and we endeavoured to do that whilst undertaking a wider review of our debt recovery practices. So we've subsequently um, done that, completed the review and implemented a range of changes. But our kind of default position now is 21 days um, or average payment terms for our customers unless they contract to take something differently. Um, likewise, we've reviewed all of our debt recovery practices as well, and for the majority of our customers, the first interaction they would have for bus from Business Stream would be 10 days after that 21-day period has elapsed. Okay. So to be clear, th th does that now cover the customers you had at that point as well? It does. So it basically okay. covers any customer who isn't on a separate contract with us, because there are some customers who opt to um, have shorter payment terms in return for a discount. So any customer who's not on a contract will have those 21-day uh, payment terms in place. And what's the feedback been on that? Really positive, actually. So I think from customers themselves, uh, we don't get a huge amount of direct feedback, but where we have had feedback is through some of the consumer bodies in particular. So I think it's been, it's been welcomed. That's good news. OK, uh, moving on, Finlay Carson. Um, the committee previously heard about the, the number of complaints regarding leakages, particularly in agricultural land, um, and, and we received an update. And, or we've put some cases forward on, on, on those leakages and how uh, Business Stream was dealing with it. Has Business Stream seen a reduction in the number of complaints from businesses with regards to the charging for, for leakages specifically uh, in relation to agriculture? I 
can't comment specifically on the number of complaints that um, relate to leakage itself. I can certainly come back with additional information, but if I look at a high level, um, compared to where we were 12 months ago, the number of customers we serve has more than doubled with our entry into the English market. Um, and the number of complaints that we've had in this last 12 months is about 1,300, which is the same as it was 12 months ago, but with twice as many customers. So I think we're definitely seeing a downward trend in the number of complaints that we're getting overall from customers. If I pick up on the particular issues around leakage and the complaints that were raised at the committee um, 18 months ago from the NFU, we've worked through each of those complaint cases systematically and have um, sought resolution for each of the individual customers. We've also been quite proactive with the NFU as well, pulling together how-to guides for their members as well around a few common themes, including leakage, shared supplies is another area as well. So I think we are much more um, proactively engaged with the FNU, NFU and their members around those issues. Can I ask, do we think, I, I don't believe we've got the balance right uh, with uh, the, the water industries, and it seems to be one of these stock excuses that it's taxpayers' money. And I, th I think the answer that the convener got with regards to con compensating businesses, that over and over, I could give you a, a whole list of complaints I've received from constituents with regards to sewage, sewer works only being part completed uh, or uh, farmers hitting water pipes which are not being buried at the uh, uh, prescribed depth and they, they having to pay for the, the bill. Do we have the right balance of customer care uh, and, and duty of care from Scottish Water with regards to its customers and we don't get the stock, computer says no, we're not going to deal with that, you're not going to get any compensation. Have we got the balance right? Because surely it can't just be a, a rush to the bottom to reduce water charges when uh, there's obviously impact on businesses as a result of some actions that Scottish Water have taken or not taken. Sides of the today. I I, th I think. I think, generally, I think the first thing to say of please, any specific constituency concerns, please do pass them to us and, and we'll make sure that we look into them. I think in general terms, the answer is yes. I mean, the one exception I would give, and I think it, I gave it to the committee last year, and it's something that we will look at, and we need to look at um, as we move in the next period, is the whole issue of where you get uh, a sewer bursting on, on farmland. And, and the reason I think that, that the, the current practice is not really up to date is because it reflects 1968 legislation where if you like the 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 the, the, the liability on us is really very very uh, restricted and i my and this is a personal view but i i do a, i do have an instinct that really we should be looking to provide a similar level of compensation when we get a, a sewage issue on a farm as it, it, we do when there's a, a, a burst pipe on, on a farm. And that's something that I committed to the committee last year. We will take forward uh, with the government as part of the planning for the 2021 uh, uh, price review. But I think generally apart from that, I think my answer to that is yes. And the reason I say yes is that the, the, the you, things like the, the, the huge reduction that we're seeing in the level of, of, of complaints that we get, the fact that when we do get challenging issues, we think really hard about them, about what is in the specific customer interest as well as what is in the general uh, customer interest. But as we go into a, a time as we are now of, of consultation on our strategic projections for the next six months, that is a great opportunity for yourselves for constituents, for our customers, to raise with us the issues that they think that we and or the Scottish Government should think about in framing policy for the 2020s. And in a nutshell, do you have enough flexibility to offer the compensation that people would generally expect? So I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about people whose houses get flooded because the wastewater drains need updated, and the answer we get, well, we don't have the budget for that, and when we keep on going, they say, well, it's, it's public money, and we don't think it's value for money. Do you, do you have enough flexibility within your budget to address those types of individual concerns? <clears throat> two, two, two different issues there. I mean, and, and first thing, and please, just to put on the, on the record, I think that when there are, and fortunately there are very rare occasions, but when there are occasions where sewage gets into somebody's house, it is quite 
the worst thing, worst impact that Scottish water activities uh, can, can have on us. And it's as much as anything, it's just a function of our, our, of our growing uh, urban areas, more paving over, more intense storms, that when that rain lands in sewers, it has to go somewhere. So because of that, we have made a huge priority with the Scottish Government that for this regulatory period, we have trebled the level of investment that we're making in dealing with issues of sewer flooding in this, in this period. But we're, we have prioritised areas and, and people and properties at risk of repeat sewer flooding inside the, 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 the premise. When it comes to issues of external sewer flooding, so it could be in a, in a driveway, in a garden, in, in, in a road, those are clearly really, uh, have a real impact on people's lives, but relatively speaking, less so than when it's inside the house. And therefore, that has not got, the, it's not been prioritised for investment uh, in this period. Now, when we look at the 2021 and beyond period, then for us and our regulators in Scottish Government, we will need to look at all these relative levels of priorities. But what I will give an absolute assurance on is that whenever anybody suffers an event of sewer flooding, we will always go along and make sure it's fully, uh, fully uh, cleaned up. I want to let Angus MacDonald in on, on the point of sewage flooding, but before we get there, because we've kind of moved away from the original question to business street, can I just raise a question? Do you record, uh, Joanna Dow, the, your data to the level of the number of agricultural customers you have in Scotland. And I ask the question because I, I understand that the NFUS has a, an arrangement with a rival provider uh, who offer a metering service. And I'm just wondering if there's any evidence that you've been losing customers to them because of that. We hold um, some information that would allow us to categorise the nature of the customer's business. Uh, I would say that it's not 100% accurate because it's based on the SIC codes that HMRC use. Um, so I couldn't sit here today and quote you the number of farms that we supply, for example. Um, certainly, if I look at kind of recent trends in customer switch and activity, what I'm not seeing is a significant reduction in the number of farms that we supply, because I can see that information on a monthly basis in terms of who's transferring out to somewhere else. Record. Thank you for that. Um, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, um, picking up on the issue of uh, sewage spills on farmland, firstly, um, I should declare an interest um, that I have a family member currently in dispute with Scottish Water uh, at the court of session um, over alleged arsenic poisoning of a herd of cattle due to sewage spills on nearby land. And I perhaps should also declare that uh, I'm a customer of Business Stream uh, on a property, uh, uh, a non-domestic property in the Western Isles. Um, convener, uh, at the last session uh, with Scottish Water, um, I raised the issue of sewage sludge spills on farmland in general and, and highlighted the concerns of NFUS, uh, who had identified numerous incidents of sewage spilling onto farmland. And um, Douglas Milliken has, has uh, referred to uh, the comments that he made last year, uh, or sorry, December 2016, um, when, when you, you last appeared here. Um, now, NFUS have flagged up uh, the fact that the current law puts the onus on the farmer to prove that Scottish Water is liable for any damage that's caused by sewage spills, rather than on the Scottish Water uh, to prove it's not liable. Um, and clearly, as we heard in the previous session, the NFUS feels that that should be changed in law, uh, as the onus of proof is the wrong way around, uh, in their view. Now, um, in your response in 2016, Mr Milliken, you said that um, you have some sympathy for that, uh, and you've also said today that um, you're still looking at it, which is disappointing because in 2016, um, I asked whether, uh, sorry, in 2016, um, you stated that uh, the law was written nearly 50 years ago. It's out of step with current customer service ex expectations and practice. And you also said we need to look at that with the Scottish Government, either to consider formalising a change in approach for the next period or to decide whether such a change should be accompanied by a change in legislation, uh, and that you said it was on your radar. But a year and a half later, we don't seem to be any further forward. Um, so what progress has been made with regard to the issue of sewage spills on farmland? Is it still on your radar? Uh, and how have the, the discussions gone with the Scottish Government on formalising a change in approach? So I, th I think, or I hope the response I gave a few moments ago really very much echoed that one that you recalled from uh, December uh, 2016. 
No, but so effectively, what we're we are we are in a a, a process of all the factors to be considered for the next uh, strategic review of charges, which will effectively come to a conclusion over the next. Um, 18 uh, months or so, and it's only as it comes to, 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 to a conclusion will we get to a definite point as to exactly what is agreed and what the priorities are uh, for uh, the, the future, and indeed whether there should be any changes in uh, policy position. But I think, but hopefully, you, what you got from the sentiment I gave in December 16 and again today is that I believe that this is something that we should look at um, and therefore if it's not something that will be progressed through legislation it's something that certainly would be within our gifts subject to government support to do from a policy perspective. <coughs> okay, thank you. Mark Roscoe. Can I just um, drill down into the pollution figures in a little bit more detail? So uh, with the more minor Category 3 incidents there's been a, a slight decrease in the last year. Um, there's been a slight increase in, thankfully, a small number of more serious Category 1 and Category 2 incidents. C can you just tell us uh, a little bit more about what the consequences of those more serious incidents have been, and in particular how your investment programme is hopefully ensuring that these incidents continue to reduce over time? Okay. Um, so you're referring to the... The, what we call the environmental, um, environmental pollution incidents, uh, and they're categorised one and two as the most serious incidents, and then uh, category three. Uh, and you're right to say that the category one and twos went up uh, a bit more uh, this year. Um, what that actually means when they're categorised um, as, a, as a category one or two, um, there's generally, depending on the severity of it, it can lead to fish kill or other environmental impact on rivers, um, etc. Uh, and if it's really serious, then the environmental regulator can take us to court uh, and prosecute us for the severity of, of the impact. Um, in the perhaps pick one of the incidents then and tell us about it one of the, the serious ones one of the incidents uh, for example we had a a, a prosecution um at uh, dunswood um it's the only one that we have been prosecuted on uh, and it was down to uh, the fact that one of our treatment works had a problem over the weekend a, a large piece of electrical cable came down the sewer, blocked up some of the equipment, uh, and it caused a discharge into the river because it wasn't going through the works for proper treatment. Uh, and at the same time, because of power issues, uh, our telemetry unit failed, uh, and therefore we didn't know about it until the next morning when the operator arrived at the site uh, about seven o'clock the following morning. So it had been running for a number of hours on the Sunday. Um, so that's one that we, it was classed as a serious one, but fortunately, it's not often that they are as serious as, uh, as serious as that. And clearly, we've we've looked at the impact of that on our equipment on our, and on our telemetry, and we've made alterations to make sure that doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. So, how, so how does your investment program address those particular issues? I mean, is that a common? A common uh, theme in relation to the more serious incidents. It's a mechanical failure. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, an unexpected failure, which you then have to go back and think about the reasons of, and then reinvest. Or is this predictable? Is it? Is there something here about your asset management that, that 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 you need to consider? Well, I think just if if I can just give a, a general answer, we've been focusing on pollution incidents for quite a while now. So if you go back to 2010. Uh, there was 825 pollution incidents in the year, and you've, have you seen from the, the document here, that's down to around about 200 in total, so a significant improvement on that. Uh, and we've done that through really focusing across our whole um, network, focusing on treatment works and what we can do to improve the uh, controls within treatment works, but also in our networks. If you look at the number of pollution incidents, 70% of them are caused by blockages uh, in the sewer uh, pipework. Um, and we've been working really hard. Um, you'll probably have seen our um, campaigns that we're running to, to try and engage with customers to tell them not to put uh, inappropriate things down the sewers because these can lead to a number of these blockages uh, that we have. So there's a number of things that we are doing to minimise that over the years. 
the, the areas that, that, that's, that's inherently challenging is we don't always know at the moment when um, a discharge might be going out of a combined sewer overflow. So if you can imagine a situation, they're designed to relieve uh, excess surface water at times of storm. But if perhaps there is a, a blockage uh, because of inappropriate material put down at, at a time of dry weather, we might not know that that overflow is discharging. So one of the things that we've agreed as a priority in our investment review for 2018 is to look at where do we need to install greater sensors in our networks to give us insights into what's happening within our wastewater system. So if, for example, there is a discharge from a combined sewer overflow on a sunny day, that will be indicative there's something actually wrong and we need to get out there and, and attend to it. So we've got quite a bit more to do over the years to come where it is cost-effective and environmentally worthwhile to get further real-time insight into what's actually happening in our sewer network. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of more uh, longer-term pollution issues, so I, I think I used the example last year of Kinghorn in, in Fife where there's bacterial loading at Kinghorn, Kinghorn Harbour, and again, that's to do with ov overtopping combined sewage. Uh, in, you know, getting into the stormwater system and, in, and into the water. Is that actually picked up in these figures? Uh, are those kind of longer-term, low-level uh, pollution problems, more, more sort of dispersed pollution uh, issues, picked up and acted on and fed back into the investment program? Yes. I know it is in that case, but yeah. I'm just interested in how you report and monitor that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, very much so. So um, all of the pollution incidents, such as the one in Kingham, for example, would be reported to SEPA, and, um, and then would be categorised on the back of, of, of those. Kingorn's a good example. We're working with SEPA uh, to put, make sure, firstly, to understand how that network works and what all the contributory parts are to it and then how that impacts on the bathing water um, itself, but also then to work out what investment will we need to be putting in place. And we're already working in Kingorn to put in the investment which will control the discharges from uh, that network into the bathing water. If I take it more longer term, by far one of our biggest challenges longer term is around controlling the amount of surface water or storm water that gets into our sewers. And uh, it's very much one of the ways of making sure that the right, you know, the, the sewers are used for what they are being designed for. So minimising, uh, you know, wash off from roads, wash off from um, uh, you know, paved areas, for example, trying to slow that water down to allow, it to get to the, to allow the uh, sewer networks to work as they've been designed to do so. And just, just finally, is your, is your um, p planning uh, horizon, is, is the time scale adequate enough to make these long-term changes in, in the system? I mean, we had a, a uh, submission from Consumer Futures, and they were saying that Scottish Water needs to adopt a 50-year strategic review. Now, that might be difficult to do given climate change, but you know what, it's coming anyway. So uh, it, 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 are the current timescales for investment adequate enough to really look at where we want to be in 50 years' time? I, mean, I think it's a, it's a really you know, great you, um, provocation from um, the Consumer Futures Unit. I mean, I think when we've, when we've pulled together all the work that's, that's informed our Shaping the Future consultation, we've tried to look as far ahead as one can reasonably do. But the, you know, there's some areas where you can have reasonable confidence as to how things might be decades down the track. There's other areas where who knows what the world will be like in the 2020s, never mind the 2030s or 40s. So we, we've quite intentionally not put a date on it. We've not said this is 25 years ahead. We've tried to look practically as far ahead as, as we can. I guess if there was an anchor, it's 2050, but it's not limited in 2050. We are trying to stretch our thinking and planning as far ahead as, 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 as we can. And even in active dialogues with government and with our, our regulators looking at the next period, we're absolutely rooting our thinking in this, not just even for six years, but trying to make sure we're doing the right things to make sure the industry and the service to customers will be in the right place in the decades beyond that. Does that assume regulatory alignment with the European Union directives, even though we'll be out of the European Union? What, what this is effectively just assuming are that there will be a, a continuation of the standards that we currently have to achieve. We're looking at already at where there may be changes in EU legislation. So, for example, there's a proposed new EU drinking water directive, and we're absolutely looking at, well, what might we need to do to comply uh, with that? Okay. I, I want to develop the climate change uh, point in a moment, but letting Alec Rowley enforce... 
be the liberty just to, to home in on a, a specific Fife question when we're talking about sewage treatment plants. You will be aware, obviously, the new Queen's Ferry Crossing has opened up uh, that, that part of, of uh, Queen's Ferry Resyth to the sewage treatment plant that's there. And there has been, over a number of years, real problems with smells coming from that site, given that, that the local communities want to home in and take advantage of the iconic bridges, etc. Where are you at in terms of trying to address those issues? Yeah, so, so um, there was... We, we have had uh, some problems in the past with, with odour, and it was the way that the treatment was carried out. Um, we, we carried out treatment called uh, lime stabilisation um, because of restrictions on the site. Um, it, some of that had to be done outside, which led to some odour issues. But we've changed that practice now, and we're doing uh, treatment within a building which has got odour control on it, uh, and then the sludge is removed from site after that. So that has um, changed the way that we do the treatment in order to reduce or minimise the odours that come from the site. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. And, and moving to climate change mitigation and adaption now, uh, Douglas Milliken has highlighted three key areas of capacity of our sewerage systems assessing the flood risk to some of our critical assets and what we need to do from a drought resilience angle. And what, so therefore the question is, what further progress has Scottish Water made on energy efficiency and climate change mitigation? So yeah, I'll, I'll take the, the energy part of that. Um, so we've got a number of uh, different uh, approaches to um, renewable energy within our business. Um, we already have uh, a number of uh, large wind um, schemes on our catchments, um, but we've also got uh, a number of hydro installations, small wind, um, PV installations, that's photovoltaics, and of course we've started uh, heat, heat from sewer schemes uh, very recently. Um, over the years, we have increased um, our self-generation capacity, um, and we're now um, generating about 13% of the electricity that we need each year, and we use a, a significant amount of energy. We use about 440 gigawatt hours of energy, um, so it's a huge amount. We're self-generating 13% uh, of that, um, and we're working with a big milestone uh, in March 2017, where we announced that we were generating or hosting uh, on, our, on our assets more renewable energy than we consume in a year. So that was one of the milestones that we hit last year. We've continued on that program. We're continuing to build um, renewable assets and we're hoping um, to announce some more um, achievements in that area very soon. Thank you very much. As well as the renewable generation, we've quite a focus on reducing the amount of energy we need to consume uh, in our, our, our operations. And a lot of that comes down to optimising our, our treatment uh, technologies. And we are on track to deliver about 11 gigawatts hours of energy efficiency savings by the end of this period. Thank you. Um, can I ask you, do you still consider capacity of the sewer system, flood risk to critical assets and drought resilience to be the key risks arising uh, from climate change? Much so, um, in terms of how do we deal with stormwater, for example, um, in, in, in essence having a very fixed assets in terms of our sewers, uh, making sure that we always are able to provide a, an adequate uh, high quality drinking water in terms of both the quantity, but also in terms of the quality out there are some of the biggest risks that we see from, from, from climate change. And one of the areas that's probably slightly different on that list there is around actually the, the changing quality we're seeing in some of our waters. So a lot of our waters come from upland, very peaty, you know, kind of uh, sources. And we're actually seeing a change in those and we're seeing an increase in the amount of organic material coming in. Going forward, in, if we look at climate change, some of the predictions are that that could become worse. Uh, for us. So a real, real challenge for us over a very long term in terms of making sure that we are um, able to provide both the quantity in terms of the quantity of water but also the, the quality itself. 
increased turbidity, is that the right expression? We, we tend to see increased turbidity, but also primarily the colour associated yes. with it. So some of the things that are very, you know, very kind of characteristic around Scottish waters, um, you were seeing those increases in, in colour, and we don't want to see that coming through to the, the high quality water we provide. In the interest of moving on, can I ask you um, just to say a little bit about external sewerage flooding in my constituency in Prestwick? Have you made any progress in that? Are you considering a pilot? How are you working with the local authority, or will it be 2021 before you get to a resolution? Because my constituents are certainly still very anxious about it. There, the there, there are a number of areas, um, press being one, but there are others that I, I could name two that are, that are firmly on my radar where we do um, have particularly concerned customers because of the issues of repeat external uh, sewer flooding. Um, so we are actively looking at the moment as to what else can we potentially do in uh, meantime short of formal uh, in, in investment. So I can't, I can't offer you specific solutions today but to reassure you, we're actively looking at are there other things that we can do meantime? That is not a promise that there are, but just to say that we are certainly looking at, at it because it, it uh, is uh, very distressing for me that here's something that is a big issue impacting people's lives and, and apparently there's little that we can do about it. And as a, as a business that prides itself on putting our customers at the heart of what we do, that is not a great place to be. So I want to make sure we, we do all we credibly can. But equally, we, we do and we will always operate in a world of constrained uh, finance, because there's a limit ultimately to how much our customers will be willing and able to pay. So there will always be some difficult choices in any investment review as to what gets promoted and what we just have to get on and, and manage uh, best we can. Thank you. Sure. Let's move this on to the issue of chlorinated water. A number of colleagues want to come in on this. Uh, Kate Forbes. Great, thanks very much. Uh, and you may be aware that there's a petition in front of this committee, which has been referred by the Petitions Committee on uh, chloramination, which was um, sparked by the situation in Aviemore. Uh, so my first question is just a more general one as to why Scottish Water has made the decision to increase the number of areas being supplied with chloraminated water. Okay. If, if you allow me, I'd like just to set a, 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 bit of, a bit of context here. We, we draw water from many, many different uh, sources across Scotland. Sometimes it's from rivers, sometimes from aquifers underground, but predominantly from upland sources in lochs and reservoirs. We then need to get that water in a safe and high quality position to customers' uh, properties. And, and the two main challenges that we need to think about are what's the nature or characteristics of that natural source water, let's say in a, a local reservoir, and what's the, the nature of the, the distribution that the pipes and the length of the pipes, the pipe material between where we collect it and a customer's uh, premise. And those two main factors drive what is it we need to do through our water treatment activities to make sure that when that water gets to any customer's premise right across that network, it is absolutely safe to drink and really high quality. Let me then drop down into specifically a chloramination. And, and the point I'm going to make here is a general point. It doesn't specifically deal with the Bad Knock and Strath Spay one, but it's a general point. The reason that we now have over a quarter of Scotland's water being chloraminated, including this water we're drinking here in the Parliament today, is because, as Simon referenced earlier, a lot of our, our natural source waters come from upland areas where the soil is quite rich in organics and, and peat, and more so in Scotland than in most other places in, in Europe. And when um, the, the, the nature of that or organic material reacts with, with, with chlorine, it, it, it provides water that's safe to drink, absolutely safe to drink, but does it, there's always a risk in a, in a very area rich in organics that it might breach the regulatory standards that we are required to uh, achieve. And just give you a bit of context here. The, the World Health Organization have a, a view in terms of guidelines for appropriate health parameters. And the standards that we need to achieve are brought in order of three times more demanding than the World Health Organization standards. So in situations where we get this combination of 
uh, rich, uh, water that's rich in organic or peaty material, combining with chlorine, we're at risk in some areas of breaching one of those regulatory standards. However, when we, when we, we use a treatment of chloramine, which is a combination of chlorine and ammonia, that means that that, that level of that particular uh, element is way below the regulatory standards and therefore is even safer for people to drink. So when, uh, you, when Scottish Water makes a decision to uh, chloraminate water in a particular area, do you engage with consumers prior to the introduction and during the sort of initial phase of that introduction? And how far in advance do you notify consumers? Is there a regulatory requirement to notify consumers about changes to their water? The, the principal engagement that we have done historically is with the um, drinking water quality regulator and the local um, health boards. And we, we will typically, uh, and, and both the drinking water regulator and NHS Scotland recognise chloramination as being a very safe and appropriate way of treating water in Scotland. And the principal reason that we will engage typically a year ahead of moving to chloramination with the NHS is to make sure that any of their patients who have kidney issues on our, dia on our dialysis machines can get adjustments made to their dialysis machines to make sure they deal appropriately with chloraminated water as opposed to chlorinated water. I think in the whole issue of informing customers, rightly or wrongly, we've historically taken a quite intentionally low-key approach. And the reason that we've done this, and I do say, I'm not saying we're right in this, the reason we've done it, and if I just draw from some evidence that the drinking water regulator gave to the petitions committee, she said that using a treatment process which involves the addition of aluminium sulfate to the water may sound alarming to customers, but it is recognised and, 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 and approved and safe. And I think we've been low-key because... If somebody gets in a postcard that we're going to add aluminium sulfate, they might be very, very anxious about it. And we've taken the view that actually, for most customers, what they rely on is there's a whole infrastructure that sits around them in terms of the National Health Service protecting public health. A drinking water quality regulator and Scottish Water working together to give them the assurance that water is absolutely safe and high quality to drink. And so we don't alarm them. So we've historically restricted our informing to those who need to do something about it, which is the NHS for dialysis and um, people who keep uh, fish as, as, as pets. Now, whether that is the is, is, is right approach, I think, is an open question. And I've certainly been quite struck that really for the first time in uh, East and South Ayrshire recently, we've had a bit of kickback to... Um, you know, why did we not do more to inform in that area? And it's posed a question for me as to is there work we should maybe do with the drinking water regulator and Citizens Advice Scotland to look at looking at the pros and cons of different approaches to um, in, in informing. If I then take the question on timing, so health board's a year ahead, and with customers typically uh, you, you three or four weeks ahead, because we try to do it from an angle of Far enough ahead, they can take action, let's say, to get the, the right filter for their fish, but not so far ahead that they may be at risk of having forgotten about it by the time the change comes along. Which customers uh, keep fish as pets? Uh, we, 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 we don't even try to. So what, so what we do is we send out a very clear A5-sized A5 uh, postcard particularly drawing people's attention to, if you have, have fish, please uh, you have a look at what you need to do and, and, and speak to your, your pet shop or your fish shop. But equally, on that postcard, we make it very clear what the change is to chloramination and a link to our website where there's a Q&A on all the issues to do with chloramination. Clarify that point. Keep. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, you mentioned that a quarter of customers ha are, you, are drinking chloraminated water. So three quarters aren't. Do you have plans to roll it out further um, or do you do it on an area-by-area area basis? And what might the challenges be for areas that don't have chloraminated water? So let, let's, let's work, work, work back the way. 
So this is all driven off data on what is the quality of water at customers' premises right across Scotland. We do 140,000 tests a year on the water supplied at, at, at customers' premises. And you, about 99 point, over 99.9% .9 of those meet all the standards. But when we see an area where either there's a fail or there may be a trend towards fail, then we look at, well, what more do we need to do from an operational practice or an investment to keep that water absolutely pure? And I think the interesting issue on chloramination is that the major driver to this is all to do with what's called trihalomethanes, which is one of those parameters that we test for. And the trihalomethanes are caused by the combination of chlorine with organic material. So if there is either an area that historically has a very, has occasionally had an exceedance of the trihalomethane standard, or maybe at risk of it in the future, let's say in the way that Simon said, because of climate change, more increased storms causing more organic material to run off, we will then look, okay, so where might we need to change our method of treatment from chlorination to chloramination to make sure that we're always within the prescribed limit for trihalomethanes? Area by area, basically. It's area by, so, for example, uh, later this year, we'll be turning it on in the, in, the, in the open area where we're building a new treatment plant, and, and one of the major drivers on there is to deal with this issue. Okay. Uh, we have a number of colleagues coming in now. Uh, Finlay Carson to be followed by John Scott to be followed you know, on this issue. Finlay Carson. Uh, just a very simple question. Are there other methods to make uh, heavily peated water safe, and does the decision to... to chloraminate the water based on the most cost-effective way to do it. So is there alternatives? Can, can there be heavier screening or filtering of the water which would take away the re requirement to, to chloramify? Yes, yeah, so um, there are a whole range of different options that we can look at as part of either the treatment or actually the, the distribution part of uh, supplying the water. And that's often about looking at different approaches to remove this organic material from the water before we add uh, the chlorine as a way of reducing that. Um, we already operate a number of the... You know, most of our water treatment works, for example, would operate to, to removing 80 to 90% plus of this organic material. Uh, a lot of the Scottish waters that we have and a lot of our source waters are very high in this organic material. And even that 80 or 90% is still not enough for us on a number of those sites to guarantee that when a customer turns on the tap, uh, that the water is free from um, a number of these uh, byproducts. Uh, so we always look at what of a range of different options. We have a very active research and innovation activity, which is looking at new technologies, new approaches, new ways of controlling our processes. And in the end, we will make a decision based on what is the best over the whole life cost, long-term view as to what's the best way of, of um, controlling, uh, you know, or making sure the water is always of a high quality and great to drink. Uh, John Scott. Thank you very much. Um, I'm impressed by the fact that you carry out over 400 tests per day to make sure our water is safe. But um, with regard to South Ayrshire, but more generally, and East Ayrshire, um, what complaints have you, how many complaints have you received regarding the chloramination process and what action have you taken to address these complaints? Certainly some of which have come from my constituents, as you know. So the... Um I don't, I, I don't have a figure for the actual number of complaints in relation to chloramination. I don't think it is very many uh, at all. What we have tracked is since we introduced chloramination uh, a week past Monday, firstly, it's taken a, a number of days to get through, right through the system, but it's now right through the system. And I think uh, at our absolute peak, we had uh, 20 contacts about issues to do with the, the taste or the smell of water. That's now dropped down to four or five a day. And that's in an area where we're serving over 300,000 uh, people. So I think I would say an, a, a negligible level of inquiry. We always get inquiries every day from customers right across Scotland about taste issues to do uh, with, with, with the water. So the fact that we're down at a handful per day in an area of over 300,000 people uh, one week after putting it into supply, I think is a kind of a, a so far so good type situation. Perhaps if it's possible, you could just supply us with those figures. In, in... Ha happy to do so. Thank you. 
Um, and when a decision is taken to change a water source or alter a customer's supply, how do you ensure that you do not inadvertently create further problems in so doing? As part, um, I mean, first of all, all of the uh, approaches, the processes, the treatment options and the chemicals we use are very highly regulated. So in terms of what we can use. So their impacts when we use them are very highly, very well understood. Um, as part of our um, process of putting or commissioning any new treatment process or any new chemical going into supply, there's a huge amount of sampling. On a, in addition to the, the, the 400 samples a day you, you mentioned, the huge amount of sampling analysis and, and science that goes on in the background to make sure before that water goes into supply um, that we, we fully understand um, you know, that it's safe, high quality, uh, yeah, hopefully will taste good and then we will look at the impact that will have as it travels through our networks. There are definitely things that we can still improve and some of our learning from uh, one of our um, uh, kind of uh, where we put one of our treatment works in this in, in this year uh, has helped us understand a little bit more about the interaction about certain types of water with our with our networks. And what we'll do is we'll use pilot rigs, we'll use test methods, for example, really to understand um, what impact uh, any change in terms of treatment or chemical will have on, on, on customers' supply. So a final question is, is this universally regarded as good practice worldwide? In terms of chloramination? chloramination. So chloramination uh, as a process is, uh, is obviously supported by the World Health Organization. It's used widely across the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, various places across Europe. Um, and it's one of a number of different disinfection methods that, that we can use uh, and we will select from as we, as we put them in. Um, but yes, it's wide, widely acknowledged as being a, a, a suitable process. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, um, so page 14, it says, we deliver high quality, great tasting, drinking water every minute of the day. What right do you have to change my water. I've noticed over the last 50 odd years or 60 years I've been on this planet that water taste has changed. Now in Strathclyde you try to put in fluoridation. Uh, I don't know if it's in yet, still it's in now. Um, but basically you have changed our water. So we have, you know, what scientific evidence do you have that what you've done uh, in this new uh, input into our water doesn't affect people. And with the complaints that people are putting in or the concerns that these petitions people have, they're asking a simple question, and I'll remind you, you made £94 million of a profit in one year. Um, so why don't you supply people who are complaining or have concerns with the filters or whatever that would cost them to install in their house? If I don't want my water affected why shouldn't I ask you, because you've changed it, to give me the, the basis to ensure that the water I'm drinking is to my taste? So the, um, the first thing just to say on, 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 on filters, and I'll let Simon really deal with most of the question, is that I think filters can give a superficial confidence to, to customers, and clearly it's absolutely their choice if they want to put them in. Our concern is unless those filters are changed regularly, there is a risk of bacterial growth inside uh, a customer's uh, property, and therefore would undermine the safe, high-quality water that we're uh, supplying. Simon. Yeah, just to, um, so in terms of the, the improvements in water quality, uh, since Scottish water has been formed, uh, have been fairly significant. So this is improving in terms of both the quality from a scientific point of view, but also the number of contacts and, and people's concerns about the quality and taste of the water. Um, so you, you're looking at a tenfold decrease in the number of failures, for example, around uh, drinking water standards. Significant reductions in the, the number of contacts that we have on customers. There is no doubt that the quality of water that customers across Scotland today get is significantly better than it was 10, 15 years ago. And that's on the back of very significant investment in terms of treatment processes, in terms of operations, in terms of skills and capabilities and science 
uh, as well. So there's been a significant improvement in the, the quality, both from a safety, but also from a, um, you know, in terms of consistency approach um, that we've seen a, across Scotland. There's no doubt, though, the taste of water is affected by where it comes from. So uh, there's absolutely no doubt of that. If you travel to anywhere else in the UK, you will find that the taste of water is very different from the, the phenomenally good tasting water we have here, uh, here today. So the, the, the taste of water is affected by the source uh, of that. And we're always looking for the most sustainable source that provides water for the, for the long term. But I just want to kind of restate the quality of water we have in Scotland today is an incredibly high standard, very high uh, and very you know, safe. And I would hope we, we achieve the, the statement we've got in the uh, strategic projections there, which is about, you know, kind of, um, you know, good to drink. I have to agree. I have to say that Scottish water is, is, is the best. But I, I do say I've noticed a change in the taste over the, the years that I've been on this planet. You go to London and, ho, 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 my goodness, the, the water down there uh, is... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Basically, but, you know, to come back to my point, and I'll finish by, by saying, why, you know, to address the petitions that we have now in front of us, why can't customers come to you and say... Um, I have a fear, you know, we can all get into it. I'll not mention the product, there's a... The products out there, you can go and buy and, you know, and you put in filters and, it, you know, put them in your, your fridge and it filters down the water and whatever. Um, at, at extreme cost, by the way. But basically, why can't we say to Scottish Water, right, you're changing my water. I don't want that. Uh, I'm fearful for skin allergies. I'm fearful for my son. I'm fearful for my, you know, dialysis, da, 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 da. You know, and it's going to cost me £2,000. I don't have £2,000. Why can't I, I get you to pay for that? I think in, in, in very simple terms, because our obligation is to provide safe, high-quality drinking water, and there's a risk in us providing filters that it would undermine the safety of that water because of the risk of bacterial formation on the filters. I don't accept that, because people, you know, at the end of the day, if I go to a doctor, I can get a prescription every so often. If I go to a, a pharmacy or I go to a, a, a company who supplies me something, they send it to me every so often. If I get a filter off of you, you will supply me with a, a, a new filter. The operative word, and I'll finish convener by saying, is a four-syllable word, safe. You said that you will deliver me safe water. If, if I don't believe that, I should be safeguarded by you to get safe water. And I absolutely agree, and that's why it is so important that we have an independent drinking water quality regulator who gives that assurance to people right across Scotland that the water, not just in aggregate, but area by area, is safe uh, to, to, to drink. Thank you. I specifically ask, though, about... There are people out there who do have some concerns about this process, and we hear uh, suggestions that, that there can be difficulties arise in relation to skin conditions and breathing difficulties. What of these claims would you accept, uh, if any of them, as being uh, appropriate and being accurate? I mean, there's, I mean, you potentially lots of complex issues. I mean, I think the the area which you caused me probably most distress was the issues that we had in 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 Badenoch and Strathspey, and a whole bunch of different reasons there. Partly because historically we didn't handle that situation well, and we took too long to get uh, on 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 top of it. But the, the skin issues was a, a particular concern that was raised there because it was a, a very good example where we actually changed the source water from a lock-up in the Cairn Gorms to abstracting from an aquifer under uh, the River Spey. And there were people who undoubtedly presented themselves with having skin issues and now that they didn't have uh, before. And the only way we could deal with it properly was actually to engage uh, NHS Highland who in that particular case <clears throat> looked really hard at the data. They spoke to all the local uh, GPs across the area, they looked at the data of skin issues after the new supply came on compared to the old supply. They looked at the instance of skin issues in Badenoch and Strathspey compared to elsewhere in the Highlands. And the two key conclusions that came out within that area 
where one, there was basically neg negligible difference between skin issues with the new supply compared to the old supply. And overall, the incidence of issues was about 20 to 30% lower in Bad Knock and Strass Bay than against the Highlands as a whole. And that was part of the evidence that NHS Highland gave to the Petitions Committee in July uh, last year. So that's probably the, clo that, that's the area where we've looked hardest uh, in at it. And I was certainly quite struck, even in part of their evidence, just the significant percentage of the population as a whole that do suffer from skin issues. And they highlighted the, the complex interaction of different factors that can give rise uh, you, you to this. So it is very much a matter for the, for the health services rather than us. And the breathing issues? I, I, I must say, I've, yeah. it's not, not one I've, uh, I've, I've heard of, Simon. You... No, not, not so. I mean, the, the, the science behind um, chloramination is really well understood. There's a huge amount of... Um, academic research, as well as organisations such as, uh, for us in, in the UK, uh, the Drinking Water Quality Regulator, the um, you know, health boards elsewhere. So there's a huge amount of data and information that kind of gives us the confidence that there are, uh, you know, that kind of that process is very safe for us to use. Um, I'm not aware of the specific breathing kind of concerns uh, in there, but I'd take a lot from the uh, I take a lot from the um, the research undertaken by NHS Highland. It talks about in terms of the actual underlying science base that says monochloramine or chloramination is safe to use. Okay, thanks. Final question on the subject, Mark Roscoe. Is the need to chloraminate uh, waters from a particular catchment related in any way to land management practices? So I know, for example, Loch Catrin, um, you know, major drinking water supply for Glasgow. You took the sheep off the hills there a number of years ago. Um, you're reforesting the area, and, and I, I understand that that isn't just a biodiversity thing. It's an economic thing, but it's also about improving drinking water quality. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know, is there a link with this particular issue? Less so, less so with this issue. The, the, the specific one there is associated with cryptosporidium, which is a, another thing that we have to control in the water, which is you know, it's, it, ubiquitous across kind of landscapes across the whole of the UK. Um, so that would allow us in terms of how do we manage that catchment better. Elsewhere, we will look at um, impacts on peatland, for example, and peatlands and whether or not sources about uh, if the peat is deteriorated, often by sheep or other uses on there, that can lead to more organic material coming into the water, which means a different treatment challenge to us. As such, we may then want to consider how do we, how do we control that. Um, but for, for Catherine, for example, is primarily driven by the kind of cryptosporidium rather than the actual other ones. But we're, I mean, we're very active in the whole area of, of, of land management. And, and uh, as much as anything, it's about, yes, trying to improve the source water, but it's, to, it's about stabilising it from further deterioration as the climate changes. So really good example, we've done a, a super peatland restoration job with the local community around our loss supplying Lerwick in, 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 in Shetland within the past year. On restoration directly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where it's going to deliver a benefit to the, 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 the source waters. Perhaps write just with the detail of that. That would be quite interesting. The, the one in Shetland, absolutely. Yeah, and any other uh, yeah. restoration projects you're involved in, because that obviously has climate change benefits yes. as well. Uh, moving on, uh, Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, just two questions. One around Scottish Horizons um, and then a local questions. Um, Scottish Horizon has seen slightly lower profits in 2016, uh, 2017 than previous years. Uh, could you explain why and what the, um, what's next for Scottish Horizons and actually also for Scottish Water International? Right. <clears throat> so the, the, um, the, the, the profitability of, of Horizons and, and International too can move about from, from, from year to year because while at one level we have set them up to be, to be profitable, we're actually asking them to be really quite entrepreneurial and quite innovative and to do things that benefit, if you like, Scottish water and the water sector as a whole. Um, so maximising pro profit per se is not the primary driver uh, for uh, the business. So if I take um, <clears throat> Horizons, they do a, a lot of work in supporting uh, the development community, for, impact, for example, doing impact assessments, helping with constructing new infrastructure for uh, developers. Um, they export water uh, offshore into the uh, oil sector in the North Sea. They do quite a bit of work on waste uh, management. They've got their own uh, food waste recycling facility at Cumbernauld. 
They also uh, are active in bringing uh, waste in from third parties into some of our wastewater treatment plants. And effectively, we, we look to bleed that waste in alongside the sewage. And as long as we can manage that within our discharge license standards, that's a great win-win. It's getting more value out of our assets. But quite a lot they do increasingly is to support um, other Scottish businesses. So we've set up two innovation uh, test centres, uh, one at uh, Gorthlick in the Highlands doing water testing and a wastewater testing facility at Bowness, where we're working typically with uh, Scottish uh, SMEs who are wanting to test potentially innovative uh, new products. So I think that, to me that's a great example, something that doesn't particularly feed through to the bottom line, but it's really good at supporting uh, the Scottish economy. Thank you. And can I move on to um, a local question, which is around Gerloch in, in Wester Ross, which I'm sure you'll be um, uh, cognizant of. Um, I think the current position is that Scottish Water are reviewing uh, the controversial um, uh, ch planned changes to wastewater treatment there in the light of the concerns, very serious concerns expressed by the local community there. Do you accept that the local community's concerns are justified? Can I start by referencing one of my earliest answers, which is that we work in hundreds of communities across Scotland, but occasionally we don't get it right. And Gearlock, I'd put in that category of, we didn't get it right. And I think the, the fundamental thing that we got wrong in Gearlock was we were going in from our own technical and, and logical perspective about what was the required level of treatment to protect the, 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 the sea uh, around Gearlock. And we didn't understand sufficiently how it looked and felt from a community perspective. So simply in Gearlock at the moment, we've got a, a, bit, a ro bit of a Rolls Royce of a wastewater treatment plant, far higher spec than really is needed uh, for that area. But actually, it, it is so advanced, it doesn't actually work as well as it needs to do. And that's why we were looking to replace it. Unfortunately, if you go to uh, an owner of a Rolls-Royce, even if it's a rather malfunctioning Rolls-Royce, and say, actually, we want to go and change it to a uh, Ford Fiesta because that's what's appropriate there, there's a feeling of loss. And therefore, given how the community feel, any person's feelings is absolutely valid. So if they feel that, even whether there, there is a, a right or, 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 or not fully right basis for it, we have failed in our, our engagement to properly take them with us in looking at all the whys and uh, wherefores around why we proposed the changes uh, that we did. Uh, Alex Rowley. I'm going to ask a couple of questions on gender and diversity. Firstly, the... Um, the Gender Representation on Public Board Scotland Act, which now has royal consent and requires boards to have representation of uh, at least 50-50 by 2020. How, how are you getting on with that? And are you, and are, are you on your way to achieving that? And secondly, I think as an employer, uh, a public body, do you have proactive policies in place to encourage uh, particularly more girls to look at a career with Scottish water. Historically, Britain, but not Europe, seems to be that when you look at some of the trades, you look at engineering, you look at all these areas, it's predominantly seen as jobs for men, jobs for the boys. Is there, is there anything that you're doing to change that, to be able to demonstrate that actually you can have a good career within Scottish water and encourage more women. I think 27% is where you're at just now in terms of, in terms of the makeup of men, women, 27% women. What are you doing to address that? And are you encouraging support for, for women at every level and all jobs within your organisation? <coughs> Okay, but why don't I start because you've asked about the uh, the, the board, um, and what I can tell you is um, I personally, as the chair, am very attuned to this issue, uh, and I have been throughout my career in lots of different spaces, and particularly here, um, and uh, where we have had searches for uh, new board members, we've been very proactive in spelling out at the beginning of the search the kinds of 
uh, diversity that we would like uh, around the board. Now, diversity is more than gender. I realize that gender is the one that's been uh, crystallized just now, but actually diversity of thought and background and experience is what makes a really strong board. Um, but I have particularly, and I have no, no hesitation about doing this at any stage in a search, looked at the um, candidates uh, who are female and pushed and spoken to a panel and whoever is considering the candidates to say, have we missed anything here? Um, I know as a woman that women often have quite different career paths than men do and that we need to be open-minded as we look at somebody's experience, as we look at their CV, um, to see what value they might bring. So um, in recent searches, uh, we've appointed two uh, very strong women um, to our board, uh, Samantha Barber um, and uh, Deirdre Michi. Um, again, very different backgrounds. They're, they're uh, contributing a good deal. Um, I would love to hit 50-50. Uh, the thing about a board is that you don't change people at will. People have terms and you change when the time comes. And so it, it's a little hard to have an instantaneous uh, impact. Um, and Douglas can speak to encouraging um, younger women up through the organization, but I will say at board level we talk about uh, the gender mix, we talk about issues such as that, we talk about what uh, programs the organization has to um, uh, encourage women to not only start but to continue their career um, right up through um, the, the decades of their lives so that they do have a chance to rise up. Um, there are women's uh, sort of networks. I've spoken uh, to the women's uh, network and talked about being professional my entire life and how you balance that uh, with um, family matters and other factors. So there are a lot of things that one can do. Um, but you're right that at the end of the day, one of the goals should be to have very senior women in the organization. And I think we're beginning to see more of that. Um, we've certainly, as a board, um, had some of our strongest uh, up-and-coming women come and talk to us so that we become familiar with them. We give them some exposure to us. So perhaps enough said from the board level, but Douglas from the executive I think, level. I think the short answer to your question is, is, is yes. And, and many, many different examples. Maybe in the interest of time, I'll just share, share two. So we are very consciously trying to, we're bringing lots of new apprentices into business, and we're very consciously in our promotional work showcasing female apprentices doing technical roles uh, as a way of showing this is a place where it doesn't matter what gender you are, you can come and have a great career here in a technical area uh, as well as uh, any others. Second one I would just highlight is if I look in, in, the, in our operational side that, that Peter runs, we have now in the past year gone up to having eight operational managers who are female, where I think probably a year ago it was two. Um, so you, and, and if you look at our whole future leadership program, that's broadly 50-50. If I look at the succession planning discussion that I had with the board in, in March, and I look at those who we see as having the potential to be in executive level positions, uh, you kind of, uh, you in, let's say, 10 years out, three quarters of them are women. Yeah, thank you. I just uh, allow you the opportunity to comment on that because I, prior to your time in this post, I visited uh, Business Stream premises and I was struck by the youthful nature of the staff. That seemed to be an emphasis in the early days. Um, is that still an emphasis? <laughs> uh, but perhaps moving on to the subject at hand, um, what work are you doing to encourage more women into Business Stream? Um, a lot as well. So kind of mirroring what Douglas and Susan have said before me, we have a real focus on family friendly policies to try and encourage uh, not only working women with children, but also working men that have families as well to provide that support. If I look at our gender pay um, reported stats for 2016-17, I think we're one of the very few organisations in the UK that did in 2016-17 have 50-50 balance across both our board and our executive leadership team as well. And again, if you look at our um, gender pay stats, again, I think we're one of the very few organisations where uh, our mean gap for pay was actually 1% in favour of women. So, um, yeah, we are consciously trying to do as much as we can to provide family-friendly policies to kind of keep women in the workforce throughout their, their careers. OK, Th thank you. To that, can I ask you about the, the customer forum? 
what work is the customer forum doing? How representative is it the customers? And what are the key priorities for the customer forum moving forward and engaging with uh, your shareholders who are the public? Maybe I'll, I'll start off with is um, the customer forum was a really successful part of our previous price review in terms of a um, you know, very innovative way of getting customer representation or customer views right at the centre of our, our price review and, and I think deemed very successfully and then being mirrored elsewhere across the world. Myself and Douglas met some people from Australia, for example, who are now mirroring that process uh, in the power industry in Australia. So a very successful model. The new forum, in terms of it, got about 50% different members uh, from uh, its, the previous version of that. And we're working extensively with them at the moment about our next price, uh, price review. And their focus is very much on the service that customers will receive now and into the future, how we will monitor our performance, uh, what will the prices be, the charges uh, for us, and also things around uh, you know, the, the whole range of different services and how we interact and, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with our customers. Uh, so for me, who I'm actually spending quite a significant amount of time with uh, the forum members, uh, they're a very welcome challenge and stimulation to us in terms of the types of questions they got, making us really think about different types of customers whether or not they be rural, urban, whether or not they are the, uh, the environment as a customer versus you know, domestic customers or business customers. We're getting a whole range of different challenges. But the, the key thing is that the forum work with us to try and understand what are the views of customers as a whole across the country. So it's not about them bringing their own views as customers or representatives. It's about us together wrestling with what is it that matters to our five million people across Scotland, and clearly the diversity of views within that, to then get that reflected as well as we can in hopefully a business plan that we will agree with them for the next regulatory period. OK. Thank you. And final question from Mark Roscoe. Can I end on a, an easy question? Um, private finance initiatives. Uh, where, where, do you, where do you go forward on this? I'm aware that 2021 first contracts are, are, are going to be finalised and you're going through a process of review and analysis. So where are you with that? Do you have conclusions on whether PFI has a role or not going forward? So we have, just to put this into context, we've got nine, nine PFI contracts. The first one of which that I think you're referring to is the one for Inverness and Fort William, which expires in December uh, 2021. So we are actively, we, we've looked at the different options and we are actively in uh, discussions with the PFI company on the way forward. What I'm about to say is an expectation or a commitment, but my expectation is that if we are here in a year's time, I'd be able to say definitively where we will be going on that. But I think if I was to give a, a basic presumption or a strategic presumption against all of them, wastewater treatment, which eight of the nine do, is a core competence of Scottish Water. And therefore, I'd expect over time that these projects will get absorbed back into our core wastewater activities. Whether precisely that happens on the date of contract expiry or whether we negotiate a small extension might vary a wee bit from contract to contract, but in principle, these eight will come back to us. I think the, the one where there's the biggest question is the contract we have in Glasgow for sludge treatment and disposal that handles 50% of Scotland's sludge. That expires in 2026. Um, and I think that's a much more open question as to what the right way forward is. I'm not saying by that that it's another PFI contract, but I think that's a much more open question because that's less an area where we've got that, that core competence at that level of uh, scale. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, that clarification. Um, can you just, just very briefly just outline what are, what are the key reasons why y you wish to abandon effectively PFI as quickly as possible and move services back, uh, back, back in? Well, is this about your core delivery? Is it about so, meeting your so core the, 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 objectives? Is the, 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 it about the, price? Is it about yeah, many reasons. I mean, I think your PFI has brought some benefits, but I think uh, you know, one, one of the, dis, the, the downsides is they're all run a, a, a standalone work. So, for example, if you look at the, the manning levels in any of those, they're typically much higher than Peter would have in his operations, where we can manage assets on a portfolio uh, basis. That'd be one, one, one aspect. Uh, another aspect, frankly, is that the, our cost of finance is much lower than if we were using uh, your private markets to pay, uh, to, to, to pay for, 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 for assets. Um, 
there's a couple of things you've undertaken to write back to us on, and obviously remind you to do that. Can I also make an observation? There have been a number of points raised by members today, perhaps a couple of points where issues that were discussed a year ago, there's been no great movement on them. We indicated there may be movement on it. So please don't wait until a year from now if there is some movement on the issues that members have sought fit to raise today. If you could write to the committee and keep us updated. So thank you for your time today. At its next meeting on the 24th of April, the committee will take evidence on the Scottish Government's national outcomes uh, and the Scottish County State Bill from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. As agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is closed. And sit tight, guys, because we've got a lot to get